I am Paul Weibbühel. I'm a researcher at Peer, and I will be the uh, master of ceremonies for this event. And my first task will be to introduce uh, Prio's director, Christian by Kreitbeken, to give a formal welcome. And Christian will be followed by Professor Lu uh, Lars Erik Sedman from uh, the Swiss uh, Federal Institute of Technology, who is uh, the project leader for this project and will give a bit of background information for this conference. So, Christian, go with yours. Thank you, Lovely, and uh, welcome everybody to today's conference on facts and myths about civil war. This conference is hosted by the Center for the Study of Civil War here at uh, PRIO. This is uh, one flagship of PRIO, perhaps not the only flagship, but it certainly is a flagship. It's uh, a so-called Center of Excellence, uh, has existed <coughs> since uh, 2002 was the first social science environment in Norway to be awarded a Center of Excellence uh, status. And as you can hear from me talking, it's uh, something we have great pride in. Um, the research that we will present to you today also have a long-standing tradition at Prio and a long-standing tradition in our collaboration with others, not the least with the uh, Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Uppsala, who is represented here. But also, in recent years, the collaboration has been expanded to include a number of uh, other partners who are playing a key role uh, in, in this work. Uh, yesterday, I happened to run into uh, an official from the Norwegian, from Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he's not here today. He made a point of taking me aside to express his deep appreciation of uh, the policy work that uh, the Center for the Study of Civil War, the CSCW, has engaged in over the past few years. This, he said, is exactly what policymakers need. It asks important, cutting edge research questions, but it also engages in meticulous, systematic, he said even patient empirical work. Most so-called policy research does not share these qualities. Rather, it's often quick and dirty, not rooted in familiarity with the literature on the topic, sometimes asking myopic questions, and often taking lightly, taking lightly on empirics and analysis. Tore Ausland, Norway's Minister of Research and Higher education is right when she consistently argues that the best applied research also has a basic quality and vice versa. But it is an argument that needs to be qualified. All applied research does not have those academic qualities. The mix has to be right. There has to be the strategic vision, the competence, the financial freedom to work long term, and I think that what shall be presented to us today is an example of what we can get when the mix is right. Personally, I find it very fitting that PRIO hosts a seminar of this sort. Last year, we worked on a new strategy for PRIO over the next four years. In that process, we were pondering about the relationship between our academic research, our engagement in public debate, and our influence on policy. And we realized that these three elements, research, public debate, policy influence, constitutes a triangle. But the PRIO triangle certainly has academic research at the root. The commitment to standards of excellence shall always be there. At the same time, of course, we're not in an ivory tower, neither do we want to be in one. So when appropriate, we certainly engage in public debate. Likewise, we do want to influence policy. And ironically, despite the fact, or the fact is ironic, rather, that uh, we now have a very high score on the so-called global ranking of think tanks. But we don't really consider ourselves to be a think tank. We are an academic research institute. It's really our ability to ask the right questions and to pursue them meticulously that is our hallmark. 
It's what makes us relevant. Therefore, it's a pleasure to welcome you all, to welcome you to this session of Midbrain. Well. Well, as always, we are delighted to be here at the PreU. And many thanks for hosting this uh, conference, uh, Christian. Before getting started uh, with today's program, let me say a few words about the, the background of this conference. Uh, in that, it all started uh, in Oslo a few years back with an informal group of researchers from Norway, Switzerland, and the UK, the so-called GrowNet Geographic Research on War Network. From 2006, uh, we have been running a collaborative project entitled Disaggregating Civil War, relying on funding from the European Science Foundation and the respective national science foundations in the three countries, as you can see up here. We have held two annual conferences before this one under uh, the GrowNet heading, uh, this being now the final conference, making, marking the end of the current collaborative project, which has involved researchers at the University of Essex in the UK, the Center for the Study of Civil War here at Priu, and ETH Zurich and University of Geneva in Switzerland. Now that uh, the project is about to end, we need to uh, take stock and present and disseminate uh, our findings. We chose to frame our presentations in terms of myths and facts, since debunking myths is, in fact, among the most important things that researchers are supposed to do. While we cannot claim to have the final word on any of uh, the matters that we will cover at this conference, we have found that some of the most common assumptions in the literature at least the academic literature on civil wars, are actually either untested and or plain wrong. Uh, we will get a sneak preview of uh, various myths in the literature uh, in Idea and Salian's uh, keynote address that will follow uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and I will return to that in uh, a little bit later. Uh, this conference uh, will address four main myths. Uh, we have invited Peter Weinstein and Eric Melander from Uppsala, Uppsala University to cover one of the most common misconceptions about civil wars uh, and conflict, both in academia and beyond. Namely, that recent conflicts have become both more frequent and more severe than they were in the past. And Peter and Eric will have some good news for us. Uh, then follow three main panels, each one devoted to an important myth and also corresponding to the notes of our project. Uh, the first panel will address my own favorite target, namely the popular claim that grievances do not matter for the outbreak of civil wars. Uh, Madam Binger from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Aspian uh, Eidhammer from the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation have both can be agreed to serve on this panel. The second panel will be introduced by Christian Gledich, who will criticize the notion that the civil wars are primarily national events. Uh, Mark Taylor from FAFO and Christian Hartwigen will participate in that discussion. And then the third panel will be led by uh, or to say, kicked off by Scott Gates, um, who will have a go at another uh, potential myth, namely the idea that uh, post-conflict democratization has been successful. Uh, Ingrid Samset from the Christian Mikkelsen Institute and uh, Peter Eide from the Norwegian People's Aid will offer their remarks in that context. As you have already noticed, we are joined here by a number of representatives of the so-called policy-making uh, community, uh, who we hope will put some of our favorite facts and myths into perspective. Perhaps some myths should rather be labeled as facts, after all, or perhaps they are no myths at all, in which case we are really trying to knock down strawmen. And perhaps some of the so-called facts may be closer to myths if confronted with real uh, field experience 
Hopefully, this conference will help us get a clearer picture of what is a myth and what is a fact with respect to civil wars. We are very happy that Andy Mack uh, from Simon Fraser University uh, has agreed to help us do the final accounting uh, by giving a summary uh, keynote address uh, later this afternoon, summing up what we have learned. While this event marks the end of the collaborative research project, it is by no means, uh, it by no means uh, uh, marks the end of our collaboration. Uh, quite on the contrary, we are uh, currently in the process of widening uh, what has so far been the GrowNet uh, network uh, by inviting other partners on board uh, under the heading of Encore uh, European Networks of Conflict Research. And there is something more. Uh, one of the main uh, deliverables coming out of the ECRP project, apart from numerous peer-reviewed publications, is a data portal. Uh, the prototype of which would be introduced by Luc Jardin uh, this afternoon. Uh, this tool, which uh, keeps the Grow heritage in its name, uh, Grow Up uh, or Grow Universal Platform, uh, is a federated data platform, making it easy to combine and visualize various data sources. And uh, I, I'm not sure, I hope uh, Luc has put on his black turtleneck. Um, in order to do the Steve Jobs show later. Uh, now, enough said about the program. Uh, let me now introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Aydin Salian, who graduated from uh, UC uh, San Diego in 2006 and uh, is now assistant professor of political science at the University of North Texas, Dallas. Despite his uh, tender age, uh, Aydin has already made the mark in conflict research by a series of high-profile publications, including his recent book, Rebels Without Borders, that he published with Kunet University Press last year, and many articles in the most prestigious political science journals. Uh, having been a guest researcher at all GrowNet nodes, including a stint in Zurich, uh, Aydin is already a member of the family, uh, and that's ideally the place to introduce today's topic. Well, thank you very much, Lars Eric, and, and good morning. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here this morning with a very distinguished group of experts on civil war and political violence. Uh, now, I've been asked to offer a few comments and a few of my own perspectives about the conference theme, myths and facts about civil war, but the fact is that many of you sitting here in this room are uh, experts on this subject, and I indeed hope to learn quite a bit over the course of the day. <clears throat> now, to begin with, I thought it would be appropriate to quote uh, a former U.S. Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, in one of his more lucid moments. Uh, he said that there are no knowns there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. Uh, to state it perhaps a, a bit differently, uh, there are things that we know, there are things that we still have yet to learn, and there are things that we have yet to imagine. Uh, and there, the solid study of civil war is certainly no different. Uh, I would argue that we've made considerable progress over the last two decades in our understanding of the topic, but there's still considerable more room to go. Now, to begin the discussion, I thought it would be useful um, in the geographic tradition uh, to point to places on the map that have recently experienced or are currently experiencing the most uh, widespread and severe uh, civil wars. A collective enterprise would be worthless if it were confined to mere statistical findings and we couldn't speak intelligently about some of these cases. Uh, armed conflicts are currently raging in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Uh, and these have certainly dominated the news coverage, and for good reason. Uh, other conflict-ridden countries include Colombia, Sudan, Chad, Ethiopia, Somalia, Yemen, uh, Turkey's Kurdish region, the Caucasus, uh, India, and Burma. The prolonged civil conflict in Sri Lanka has recently come to an end, uh, gladly so, uh, but it remains to be seen if peace will hold in the long run. There are numerous other simmering uncertainties as well at, at the lower level, uh, but these are currently the most deadly hard-fought conflicts in the world. But it's also useful for us as researchers and as policymakers 
to think about where the conflict is not. Uh, with the exception of Colombia, the Americas are now largely peaceful. And this is a revolutionary transformation. Latin America was once a region plagued by civil wars and brutal authoritarian regimes. Uh, conflicts in Central America and Peru have gladly come to an end. Uh, and with a few notable exceptions and some backsliding, uh, Venezuela and Honduras, for example, uh, the region is now much more democratic than it's ever been in the past. Uh, the Balkan Peninsula is also now relatively peaceful. Many Balkan states are now firmly integrated into the rest of Europe, although the final status of Kosovo has yet to be determined. Conflict in, in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam are now left to history. Uh, and all this, though the situation is far from resolved, the deadliest conflict of the latter half of the 20th century, uh, the conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it's not resolved, but it is much more manageable and much more tractable now than it was uh, even 10 years ago. Uh, and I could go on. So entire neighborhoods, it seems, become enveloped in bitter wars and conflicts altogether, uh, and entire neighborhoods eventually transition to peace altogether. Uh, and, conf and conflict research has shown this to be the case. So it's important for us to look at both of these sets of cases and understand the causes of civil war, uh, but also the capacity of societies to be transformed by peace. Now, the study of civil conflict has seen tremendous progress over the last two decades. Uh, and in discussing facts, facts and myths, I would like to give a sort of an intellectual history of the discipline, uh, at least according to me. Uh, during the Cold War, there were certainly scholars such as Charles Tilley, Ted Robert Gurr, David Scotchpaul, and others who studied civil conflicts and large-scale revolutions. Uh, however, most conflict scholars focused on great power rivalries uh, and international disputes. Uh, and this was certainly understandable given the conflict between the superpowers and the threat of a third world war. Uh, and many of the, the Cold War era insurgencies were simply seen as an outgrowth of the overarching structure of power. Conflicts in Afghanistan, Nicaragua, Angola, and elsewhere were seen as simple outgrowths of the US-Soviet Union struggle for power of influence. But since the end of the Cold War, really over the last two decades or so, uh, we've seen much more attention paid to civil conflicts uh, and I believe that we've done well as a research community in building upon a cumulative body of research, building on each other's findings, and speaking to one another as a discipline. Uh, early on in the 1990s, the conflict scholarship uh, and conventional wisdoms were often clumsy, um, clumsy at best, but pernicious at worst. Uh, and this led to several myths, or perhaps we should say partial truths, uh, about civil wars, about how they're fought, and how they eventually come to an end. Um, so in thinking about this, I'd like to focus on, on five myths in particular. Uh, the first is that conflicts are driven by a clash of civilizations, a clash of cultures, and a clash of ethnicity. Uh, in the early 1990s, a commonly heard argument was that civil wars were the result of some deeply seated primordial hatred between ethnic, religious, or civilizational groups. Uh, Robert Kaplan's Balkan Ghosts argued that the roots of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia were to be found in ancient hatreds between ethnic groups and the revival of centuries-old animosities. Uh, similar statements were made about conflicts between Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda and Burundi. Uh, because of colonial legacies, these groups are just destined to despise one another and be uh, subject to periodic uh, bouts of fighting. Samuel Huntington's book, Clash of Civiliz Civilizations, mostly focused on international conflicts, but the argument was the same. There were deep-seated, deep cultural incompatibilities between civilizations, particularly between Islam and the West, uh, and these would lead to violence. Uh, and the argument was, of course, intuitive. Uh, we saw conflict in the Balkans, in Central Africa, and elsewhere, pitting one ethnic group uh, against another. And these were typified by horrendous acts of ethnic cleansing and genocide. So, ethnic cleavages and old views must have been uh, driving them. Uh, but since those early works, scholars have largely scrutinized and discredited those views. There's simply no evidence that ethnic diversity by itself leads to conflict, and that primordial hatreds are, are what's doing the work. For every Bosnia or Rwanda, there are countless other ethnic groups that uh, live together, uh, and cleavages that do not live, uh, lead to widespread uh, bloodshed. Uh, what's more, if ethnic divisions are predisposed to periodic outbursts of fighting, then there can be no hope for peace. Uh, 
Historical memories linger and are fed by fresh blood. Uh, instead, over the last several years, we haven't abandoned the notion that ethnicity is important, but we have a much more nuanced and complex contingent understanding of the role of ethnicity in driving these wars. Uh, ethnic identity is not some fixed genetic marker, but it's a social construct that can shift its meaning, its salience, and its importance over time. Hutus and Tutsis can intermarry, can work with one another in one period, uh, fight bloody civil wars in the next, and then reconcile later. <coughs> ethnicity does matter, and it's important to understand the role of ethnic grievances, of ethnic discrimination, and so on, but they don't explain the whole story. Uh, scholars have focused on the role of state weaknesses, of the elites and manipulating ethnic sentiments, of patterns of deliberate exclusion from positions of power, and competition and outbidding within ethnic groups as important drivers uh, of the equation. Now as for the famous Clash of Civilizations thesis, uh, September 11, 2001, and some of the events thereafter seem to strongly confirm Huntington's thesis, especially about the rift between Islam and the West. Uh, but I would argue that since the, the nine years since 9-11, we've actually shattered the notion of a clash of civilizations. Rather than a conflict between Islam and the West, we've seen bitter disagreements within cultural groups. Uh, clearly, there is no unified West with a common position on Afghanistan, Iraq, or even the conflict against Al-Qaeda. Uh, but even more importantly, Al-Qaeda's call to arms has largely fallen on deaf ears within the Muslim world. True, there are some small groups that use the Al-Qaeda brand, but the movement has not attracted the widespread following that many thought it would or feared it would. Uh, and indeed, the horrors of, this, is, of Islamic extremism and the brutality of groups like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban have caused moderates to coalesce against these movements in the Muslim world, especially in Iraq and Pakistan. Uh, in Shia Iran, rifts between the people and the government and fights within the clerical establishment uh, have deepened. So instead, the real conflict is within Islam, uh, rather than between civilizations. Nowadays, ancient hatreds has become a hollow concept. Uh, take the Iraq conflict, for example. Uh, ethnic cleavages and decades of domination by Sunni Arabs under Saddam Hussein uh, certainly do count for something. Uh, but it would be a grave mistake to characterize this conflict as simply one pitting Shias and Sunnis and Kurds. Uh, analysts have moved beyond such simplistic notions. Uh, instead, we see conflicts within groups and alliances across them. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was largely marginalized by the Awakening Movement, which was, comp which was comprised of fellow Sunnis. Shias were split between moderates in the government and hardliners following Muqtada al-Sadr. Uh, even the Kurds are internally divided by partisan loyalties. And some actors have been trying to work across sectarian lines to form a stable government. So in short, ethnicity is still a useful concept, but it's an extremely complex, contingent one that can't be simply reduced to an ancient hatred's logic. Uh, the second myth or, or partial truth that arose during the 1990s uh, was that many, if not most, rebel organizations are uh, not motivated by any legitimate grievances or desire for political representation, but are primarily driven by greed and opportunities for plunder. Uh, rebellion was seen as a quasi-criminal activity, and insurgents were no better than the criminal mafias. Uh, Mary Caldor, for example, argued that these new conflicts are uh, fought by insurgents motivated by profit rather than ideology. Uh, Paul Collier and Ankle Hoffler uh, found that using natural resource dependence as their main indicator, greed rather than grievance is a better explanation for civil war. Again, the logic was very simple and intuitive. Uh, after the Cold War, conflicts were no longer driven by some great ideological conflict between communism and capitalism. Uh, in addition, superpower funding for many of the insurgents dried up, and these groups had to look for alternative sources of financing. Um, some groups clearly did degenerate into narco-terrorists or looters. Uh, in Sierra Leone and Angola, uh, groups turned to looting diamonds to, to fund their activities uh, in Colombia, the FARC descended into a, became a narco-terrorist organization. Uh, but it would be an error to conflate all insurgent groups with criminal gangs. Uh, since the early works on the subjects, we have a much more nuanced view of the role of resources in fueling armed conflicts. Uh, groups certainly need funding to sustain their operations. Uh, many do turn to looting and extortion, 
but this is nothing new. Uh, more importantly, focusing on greed dismisses any legitimate grievances that these groups may have had. If a group is fighting for uh, a greater control of a country's oil revenues, are they being greedy? Or are they trying to advance the legitimate economic interests of an impoverished minority? Uh, in addition, scholars have pointed to several pathways through which dependence on natural resources might lead to armed conflict. Um, yes, natural resources might lead to incentives for looting and plunder, but they may also in increase the rewards that rebels uh, seek to achieve by controlling the state. Uh, perhaps most interestingly, scholars have shown that natural resource dependence weakens state capacity through increasing corruption, through reducing the need to develop a competent bureaucracy, and through the decline of other sectors of the economy, all of which increase the odds of a civil war. Uh, no doubt, groups like Sierra Leone's RUF were more like criminal gangs in Los Angeles than professional armies. Uh, but to say that most rebel organizations are motivated by, motivated by greed is a simple overstatement. Uh, the third myth, and one which we'll hear about later this morning, uh, is that the world is becoming a more dangerous place. Uh, again, during the early 1990s, there was a considerable amount of pessimism about the future. Uh, Robert Kaplan, uh, for instance, wrote of the coming anarchy in a famous article, arguing that the world was becoming a more dangerous place and that state failure had become widespread as ethnic tensions over population and resource scarcities became more prevalent. Uh, during that time, it was indeed difficult to be optimistic. If we think back to the early 1990s, uh, the term ethnic cleansing had entered into everyday use. Genocides were underway in the Balkans and in Central Africa, and international terrorists such as Al-Qaeda were beginning to launch their attacks. But looking back from 2010, the truth is that the world has actually become a bit more peaceful. True, there are still several hotspots around the world, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and others, but on the whole, the number of civil wars and insurgencies have declined since their peak in the early 1990s. Uh, conflicts in Nicaragua, Guatemala, Peru, Mozambique, Angola, Bosnia, Cambodia, and elsewhere have all gladly come to an end. Uh, the world is not a peaceful place by any means, and I don't want to give a false sense of, uh, of optimism. Uh, but we have seen, I would argue, a considerable degree of progress in the human condition. Democracy is now more widespread than it's ever been before. Levels of poverty and child mortality are now lower uh, than they were in the past. And many of the world's worst dictators and war criminals have faced or are now facing international tribunals. Uh, and as I said before, the threat from Al-Qaeda is still very real, but our very worst fears have yet to be realized. Uh, clearly, there's still much more work to be done. Uh, there's mm -hmm. been considerable progress in Latin America, Eastern Europe, and East Asia. They've seen real positive changes for good while Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia um, have yet to experience a real peace dividend. Uh, these are still regions that suffer from corruption, authoritarianism, and war, but I believe there are grounds for optimism even in these uh, cases. Let's not forget that for the first half of the 20th century, Europe was the world's basket case. Europe, Europe's history was uh, punctuated by two destructive world wars, the Holocaust, the rise of fascism and communism, all of which were extremely disrupt disruptive. Now Europe's peace is bolstered by democracy, human rights, commerce, and robust international institutions. So peace is possible, even in the darkest corners of the world. And the fourth myth, and, and related to this last point, is that there was a, there was a common perception uh, that persists even today among some circles that peacekeeping doesn't work. Uh, institutions such as the UN were seen as dysfunctional, prone to infighting. Uh, conflicts were thought to be too intractable to resolve. Uh, despite early enthusiasm for peacekeeping, disastrous failures in Rwanda and Somalia led to quite a bit of pessimism about the ability of outsiders to intervene. Uh, some scholars, such as Edward Lutwak, even wrote that we should, quote, give war a chance. Uh, according to the argument, peacekeeping was actually counterproductive. It's better to let actors fight to the finish. Uh, any externally imposed settlement was seen as doomed to failure because it would not be durable. Uh, but despite some notable failures, the last two decades have actually, in my mind, demonstrated the remarkable and resounding success of peacekeeping operations. Peacekeepers have helped to secure the peace in Nicaragua, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, 
Liberia, East Timor, Cambodia, Bosnia, and elsewhere. Uh, the bloodiest conflict since World War II, fought in the DRC, was seen as one of the more intractable, difficult to resolve conflicts of the time. Uh, it blended elements of civil and international war. It was seen as simply a, a conflict that was doomed to linger on. But only after a UN peacekeeping mission was put into place with Chapter 7 authority to go after militants by force, did we see the situation begin to stabilize. Um, true, we don't have absolute peace in the Congo. There's still violence in the eastern provinces. And yes, there were some critical missteps early on in the UN mission, but it would be hard to argue that the UN mission did not play an important role in managing Africa's continental war. Uh, oftentimes, combatants on the ground simply cannot commit to peace on their own, and they need help. The process of disarmament can be risky, uh, especially if actors don't have assurances that the other side will not renege on peace agreements. And third parties can help stabilize the situation by helping to assuage these fears and build trust among the combatants. Disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs haven't been flawless, but they've certainly helped to stabilize in many countries. Uh, now, of course, external interveners, the UN or otherwise, cannot do it all. Uh, establishing democracy, the rule of law, and a pathway toward economic development are extremely difficult, especially soon after a civil war. Uh, but a more modest goal of putting an end to active hostilities and securing a peace agreement can be facilitated by peacekeepers. Uh, and then a final myth, or, or a, a newer emerging myth that I would like to uh, address, uh, is that climate change is somehow inevitably going to lead to civil war uh, and state failure. Now obviously it's, it's extremely difficult to evaluate claims about the future. Uh, the most dramatic effects of climate change have yet to be felt, and we simply do not know what the future is going to hold. Uh, but some well-intentioned people and organizations have uh, positively linked climate change with violence and war. Uh, as noted by the decision to grant uh, Al Gore and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change the Nobel Prize for Peace. Uh, the most commonly heard logic by NGOs uh, and others is a fairly simple, straightforward one. Climate change will make resources such as water and food to grow, uh, land to grow food on scarce, and we'll see armed conflict over these dwindling resources. Uh, in addition, migration from affected areas and from the coastline will lead to tensions between locals and immigrants. Declining resources and natural disasters, uh, climate change in general, uh, no doubt will present enormous challenges for the affected communities. Climate change presents, represents one of the greatest challenges that humanity has ever faced. Uh, so does the future portend more war and bloodshed? Perhaps. Um, but evidence from past environmental crises and natural disasters doesn't paint such a neat picture. Scholars have looked at how natural disasters and environmental degradation affect armed conflict, and so far the findings are weak and somewhat ambiguous. Some find a modest effect, some find no effect. Some scholars have even suggested that natural disasters can promote cooperation among communities. Uh, and it's easy to see why a simple scarcity logic is flawed. Uh, civil war does nothing to increase the level of resources in a society, and it indeed destroys the natural environment. Fighting over a dried up well does nothing to bring back the water. Uh, armed conflicts are fundamentally about the distribution of resources, not about their absolute level. And this distribution is determined by a political process, by power and access to government institutions. It's part of a political bargaining process. Some societies might actually see greater conflict between individuals and local communities over resources. In some cases, local disputes might actually bubble up to something like a civil war or a state failure. Uh, but in other cases, communities will devise strategies for meeting people's needs, they'll promote conservation, and they'll find ways to adapt to changing environmental realities. So rather than blanket statements about climate change, natural resources, and war, current research suggests a much more contingent relationship. In societies that are already well-governed, democratic, and transparent, Environmental crises rarely lead to humanitarian disasters and war. Uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen found that famines have never occurred in any democratic society with a free press, uh, despite prolonged droughts. Uh, in societies that already face problems such as inequality, authoritarianism, and corruption, climate change can exacerbate these problems and may indeed contribute to conflict. Uh, some have linked the conflict in Darfur to uh, environmental competition between 
pastoralists, and farmers. Um, yet these types of localized conflicts between farmers and herders persist throughout the Sahel Zone. Uh, in Sudan, the uh, local disputes only escalated to civil war when the government decided to, to pick sides and to choose a winner, uh, so to speak, uh, in, the, in the conflict and to arm tribal militias. So yes, we need to curb CO2 emissions. Yes, we need to better manage our natural resources. But promoting democracy, good governance, and human rights can also help to mitigate some of the risks associated with environmental crises. So as you might have inferred, uh, I'm guardedly optimistic about the future and about the state of the world. We have, as a species, made considerable progress, uh, and as researchers, also learned quite a bit about uh, this, uh, the, this phenomenon. But we must work hard to maintain progress and to carry it forward. Uh, and I've offered several uh, of my own sort of favorite myths in the literature, um, but I've given very few facts. Um, I suspect that over the course of the day, we'll learn quite a bit about new findings and new trends in the research. Uh, but I wanted to take this opportunity to commend the Grow Network uh, for the terrific service they've done to the academic community and to the policy community in, in general. Um, they've done wonderful work in collecting new data, in providing systematic analyses of civil war, and for the sheer volume of publications that they've able, been able to produce. Uh, the premise behind Grow's work is compelling. It's not a look, enough to look at country-level factors when we're trying to explain uh, what causes civil conflict. Some conflicts are confined to particular regions within countries, and we need to understand the local dynamics of conflict. Other conflicts span national boundaries and don't respect borders, um, and we have to understand their regional dynamics. And the project has done a wonderful job of integrating theories of the geographies of violence with systematic data collection and analysis. It's actually changed the way scholars, not just in the Grow Network, but beyond the Grow Network, think about civil war uh, and violence. Disaggregated studies of conflict and geographic tools and software are now at the cutting edge of conflict research and have reshaped the field. Um, so if GROW has defined the present, uh, where is the future headed? Uh, and a conclusion, let me uh, make a pitch for two new directions in civil war research. Uh, the first is to provide more context and nuance about different types of civil war than monocausal explanations can offer. Um, social scientists will often look for a few simple variables that explain a lot of the empirical record. Uh, theories will argue, for example, that natural resource dependence or uh, poor state capacity or climate change uh, will lead to civil war. Uh, we like simple, straightforward theories that are generalizable that carry across a lot of cases. Uh, but simple soundbite theories often lead to myths and the perpetuation uh, of myths. Instead, I would argue that rather than a single concept, we actually have many forms of civil war. We don't need a new theory to explain each and every type of fighting uh, and each and every conflict, but we should also avoid one-size-fits-all explanations. Uh, ethnic conflicts, revolutionary violence, secessionist conflicts, proxy wars fought by rebels with outside backing, uh, and so on, they may share certain features, uh, but they also have important distinct sets of causal factors behind them. And we need to think about uh, typologies of violence and different varieties of violence in developing our theories. Uh, and second, I would argue that we need to analyze civil war, rebellion, insurgency as one form of political opposition among many, rather than some phenomenon that is somehow sui generis. Uh, taking up arms against the state is relatively rare, but it's one tool, one tactic, that's used within the broader category of political dissent. Government opponents can take to the streets with peaceful demonstrations, boycotts, strikes. Uh, dissidents can riot against the state without real formal organization. And groups can clash with one another without taking on the government. Uh, these types of political and social unrest have brought down entire governments and can be just as threatening to ruling elites as armed insurgency. Uh, think, for instance, as, uh, of the ongoing drama in Thailand. Uh, it's certainly been deadly, it's certainly uh, rock the institutions uh, in Thailand, but it doesn't meet conventional definitions of civil war. Many scholars still see, treat civil war as a binary variable. They're either, they're, either there's a war or there's peace. Uh, but the absence of armed rebellion in Norway is not the same as its absence in Thailand or Kenya or Honduras. So when do peaceful opposition activities escalate to civil war? Uh, are some actors more likely to use violence while others use more nonviolent means? Uh, how does armed conflict in general relate to other forms of social and political unrest. Uh, 
Uh, until recently, we've, we've, act, we've lacked the data and tools to analyze these questions, uh, but I believe <coughs> that in the future, we'll be able to, to look at those questions more systematically. So in conclusion, the last two decades of Civil War research have taught us a great deal, uh, and many people, many of you sitting in this room, have contributed to a collective body of knowledge. Uh, many common assumptions about Civil War have been shattered, many new robust findings have emerged. Uh, but there are still many more known unknowns and unknown unknowns out there. Uh, sometimes our research hits dead ends, and sometimes we uncover new gems of knowledge, and both are useful. Uh, but let's never forget what our ultimate goal is, to use whatever knowledge and whatever scholarship uh, that we acquire about the causes of Civil War to promote the ult ultimate objective Priya has a long-standing relationship with um, the Department for Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University. And one of the products of this collaboration is the annually updated uh, Uppsala Priya Armed Conflict data set. And I think it's fair to say that today this data set has become the industry standard for quantitative research on civil war. So I'm very happy to give the floor to Peter Wallenstein and Eric Melander, uh, who are directors for the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, uh, to present some recent trends in armed conflict and perhaps uh, debunk some prevalent myths uh, along the way. So, Peter and Eric. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, we are going to deal with a couple of myths here, and that's why we need to be two. These are very, very horrible myths that require a lot of brain power to deal with. <laughs> uh, uh, as you just heard, we come from uh, Uppsala University uh, and from the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, and you can see here is the thing up there, UCDB. Uh, and uh, many of the, of the work that we just heard very, very ably summarized, of course, build on a particular definition of conflict. I will explain that a bit as we go along. We're going to show you four slides. Uh, I will talk to the deputy director of the program and talk about the next two, and then I'll come back and talk about the third one. So let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, many of you have seen this one. It's sort of become a standard picture, but I think it requires a bit of an explanation. What it tries to do is to summarize in a very succinct way the pattern we have seen of armed conflict in the world since 1946 up to and including 2009. This is actually information which will be out when the next issue of Journal of Peace Research is out, which I'm not sure when it is, but in a week or two. So you get a preview here. Uh, now, as you can see, when you look at this picture, there is a continuous rise here of armed conflict up to the peak year, which will be 1990, 91. 92, those were the ones with more than 50 armed conflict, as you can see here. Uh, and then we see a gradual decline of armed conflict down to the lowest spot point here in, in 2002, and uh, that's a little below 30, and then a gradual rise again, actually about 25% rise in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Now that's all kinds of armed conflicts, uh, and I will explain in a moment uh, what we actually mean by armed conflict. Now the red one here are those armed conflicts which we define as wars, as you can see up here. Uh, and that moves in a similar way, but of course it's less dramatic. Uh, it goes up to about uh, 18 or so here in the middle of the early 90s, and are down to about 6 uh, for 2009. Now what then is an armed conflict? I think that's very important, and we devoted a lot of work on that uh, at uh, the department in, in Uppsala, and you will find these things if you want. Uh, at this address down here, it's all available for free. Since last year, this is actually financed by the uh, Uppsala University itself. Uh, so we are, are in, a, in a better situation than we've been ever before when we have been hunting for funds wherever they were available. Uh, now we are sort of safe as long as the university is safe. That is. Um, now we publish this in various ways. So the easiest way for you to find it is on the website. I already mentioned the Journal of Peace Research, which has been a very important way of uh, disseminating the information.
this year. You will hear more from him later on. Uh, and we also done some with CIPRI, uh, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. They only want big conflicts, uh, and everything should be big with CIPRI. Uh, we think also the small is important. But these are different after you go to these different sources that they actually come from. And that's why it's important uh, for me to explain a little how uh, the definitions are developed. Because if you are going to discuss a trend, you need to have a definition that remains the same, that is comparable across time and space. And we have such a definition. So what you have in the total number here of armed conflicts are armed conflicts that in one year result in at least 25 people being killed in the battles. Uh, 25 is a relatively low number, as, as some, somebody said just last week, you know, 25 is almost zero. Well, it is not. It's 25 is possible to pick up. Uh, these are enough size of these events for media and so on to report them. Uh, and they, uh, to, our, to our mind, is, uh, indicate that there is a sort of a sustained battle going on. In order to kill 25 people, you need an organization, you need weapons, you need training. Uh, and you need to sustain that at least for a year to arrive at that high number, uh, which is high in that sense. And assassination is possible to do by one individual, but uh, we want something which is a little more sustained. Of course, the traditional definition has been the one down here, which is 1,000 deaths in a year. That's, uh, of course, a very high intensity. It's uh, not an easy thing to do uh, if you want to plan an attack. Uh, that's the traditional definition, you can say, that comes from the Correlates of War project in, in Michigan, which you know, was really the origin of many of these things. But as you see, if we only go at the war situations, the, the variations will be fairly small during the years. And particularly, it will not tell us the, I think, most important thing, that there are continuous number of armed conflicts that go on for a long period of time. They might be rather small, but they still have devastating effects cumulatively on countries and on neighborhoods, etc. And of course, many of them have the danger of escalating into war. So this simple distinction makes it possible to think a lot about what is it really that makes small conflict become big and also, of course, give us ideas how to deal with it. Now, uh, if there is any good news in this, is of course this variation that armed conflict do vary over time. And many of these myths that we see assume almost a linear development. Things are getting bad and they're getting worse. And reading the newspaper and just seeing the pictures that IDR presented first with, with the 14 different hotspots that you had, uh, suggests to the reader of the, of the media or the internet that the world is in complete turmoil and everything is, is chaotic. And of course, media will not give us this long-term picture. It gives us the news of yesterday, so to say. And if we want to see the longer picture, it requires really academic investigation like the ones that we're talking about here today. So these variations will normally not be picked up in media. And we find these variations quite interesting because it suggests war is not a matter of you know, something ingrained in human nature or very simply related to population or something like that. It is a much more complicated factor. And you can say that's, in a sense, good news. It means that we can deal with this. It isn't as any other social phenomenon. It is a human-made uh, uh, problem, and in that sense, it can also be dealt with uh, by human beings. So that would be one of the good news. Um, just one last point. Uh, when we look at this, we can say, well, how would we explain this? And of course, this is the Cold War period. Uh, and you can say the Cold War was maybe a Cold War in Europe, but you can see in, in here are conflicts in the 60s, here is the Vietnam War, here is the Afghanistan War, here is in one of the 1980s, there is the Iran-Iraq War. All these were in one way or another, as I mentioned, sponsored from the outside. But when you look carefully at them, of course, they were they involved internal power struggles. They, turned, they involved who should rule in, in Angola, who should rule in Nicaragua, and who should rule in, in Vietnam, etc. They involve very local kind of situations. Uh, and that means that throughout this period, although we have defined things as interstate, they were in fact the, the, the real disagreements, so to say, were about the internal power distributions. And that continues to be the case. 
but the fact that it reduces here the end of the Cold War, this is, I think, the real, very interesting puzzle. And I'll come back to that one. Uh, and the problematic thing is then this increase here again. What is now happening that doesn't seem to continue the trend? If this trend had continued, we would have been down here somewhere. But we seem to be a bit away from that. Uh, and if you want to have a very simple explanation, you can say that here is a period of a lot of negotiations. Here is a period where terrorism has been the central thing, and you don't negotiate with terrorists. But I'll come back to that, and then uh, uh, we'll uh, try to summarize later on what we do. Final point. These are the armed conflicts. Sorry. Uh, it's that bottom up there. Uh, you can say, well, does this include all violence in the world? And of course, it doesn't. This is just one measure of getting some kind of violence. And uh, together with the Human Security Center, we have developed additional categories of violence, which we call uh, non-state conflicts, that is, between groups which are not really regular wars, but between reasonably organized groups that still attack each other uh, for maybe very local reasons. And the second category that we have added is one-sided violence, where you have one actor basically attacking civilians on the other side, who so are not organized into armed uh, groups or, or, or have an organization. This would be genocide situations, some of the terrorist situations, etc. And what we are doing now is to try to do a similar curves for these, because an argument saying that this reduction that we just talked about, maybe it's replaced by other kind of violence. And so, in that sense, uh, we would still have a, a high level of uh, organized violence going on in the world. So far, the data that we have gathered does not suggest that. There is not a sort of a, a simple thing that if you reduce one kind of violence, another kind of violence pops up. It's not that easy. Uh, and in fact, these might be quite a distinct type of phenomenon, depending on very different kind of conditions. So that gives me a lot of confidence that what we have done here works. It, it is built on a central, a very simple, but still applicable definition. And it really reveals that the world is not getting increasingly dangerous. The world is complicated, yes, but we can deal with it. And now let me hand over to Eric for the following two slides. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to say something about um, this notion that uh, the wars of today, or specifically following the end of the Cold War, are particularly brutal or particularly atrocious. That civilians are suffering more, on average, in the armed conflicts and especially the civil wars of today than was the case typically during uh, the preceding decades during the Cold War. Uh, so this is a, a particular and very important aspect of the notion, the idea of uh, the so-called new wars. So are the new wars, the wars of today, uh, more atrocious uh, than uh, the civil wars of previous decades? Uh, of course, there are other um, ideas that have been forward in connection with the new wars concept, like uh, the criminality of violence and the use of child soldiers and so on. We're not going to speak directly to that right now. But look at the direct human impact of um, civil war. And some of the trends that we um, observe uh, and the analysis we uh, present here um, build on observations that have been made by others, of course. Among them, um, Andy Mack in the Human Security Report um, noted already the decline in armed conflict, for the decline in the number of armed conflicts following the end of the Cold War, and the decline in, in the number of battle deaths, <coughs> and also the decline in uh, the prevalence of genocides and systematic massacres of civilians. Uh, and this Patrick Gladich and others wrote about, collected data on battle deaths, and, and wrote about um, the variations in battle deaths uh, over time, and the average intensity of civil wars in terms of battle deaths. So what we have done is to look at the average intensity um, of genocides in the active civil wars and intrastate armed conflicts. Um, and the average um, number of people being forced to leave their homes in the active armed conflicts um, within states, the civil wars, and comparing those numbers over time. 
Uh, and uh, we also control for um, a lot of other explanatory factors uh, when we do multivariate analysis, like um, the wealth of the country. Maybe it is the case that systematically uh, wars of today are, are fought in um, richer countries, and that would hide um, the extent to which people are targeted because richer countries can deal with refugees better or something like that, but that's not the case. But anyway, it's just an example of the things that we have control for. Um, so uh, the reason why we look at uh, these measures, um, the average level of massacres and, and genocides, on the one hand, and uh, um, forced migration, on the other, is that there is no systematic data on direct data on uh, the number of civilians being killed in armed conflicts going back um, before the end of the Cold War. There is no such systematic data. So it's very difficult to, to uh, draw any conclusions about trends and, and make comparisons over time with regard to the atrociousness of civil war. So we have to get that this direct human impact of civil war indirectly by looking at data on large-scale massacres, genocide, and forced migration. And the argument is that if civilians are targeted uh, more systematically and more viciously uh, in today's civil war, that would result in genocides being picked up by those who, who collect data on genocides and massacres, or it would be picked up um, in the form of forced migration, internally displaced people and uh, external refugees crossing borders. So the one-sided violence data that we have that Peter mentioned goes back to uh, 1989 so far. And there is no increasing trend in one-sided violence. So at least uh, in our data of direct violence against civilians, there's no increasing trend. Uh, but we are, are of course interested in compar comparing with the time period before 1989. <clears throat> this is the average atrociousness of interstate armed conflict. Uh, 1955 to 2004. So the data on, on uh, atrociousness of, of on, uh, massacres and genocide comes from the State Failure Project by uh, led by Barbara Hart and others. So on the y-axis we have uh, a scale of the intensity of genocide, politicide, um, and we have averaged them by um, we have averaged that number for the active interstate armed conflicts um, in every year. And we can see here that, um, first of all, there were few uh, interstate armed conflicts in the 50s, as you noticed in the uh, previous graph. And there were also few uh, instances of systematic killing of civilians amounting to genocide politicide. Basically, what we have is, is Tibet in 1959, which is driving uh, the picture. But what we can see here is that, on average, uh, during the Cold War, it happened that, that uh, the combatants of the civil wars resorted to massive uh, massacres of civilians uh, to a much larger extent than in the post-Cold War period. So some examples of, of, of course, of uh, these kind of massacres during times of civil war uh, during the Cold War period would be uh, Tibet, as I mentioned, Indonesia, 1965, Nigeria, Biafra War, uh, 1967, 1970, uh, East Pakistan, Bangladesh, 1971, and of course, Cambodia, the Killing Fleet, Khmer Rouge, Iraq, using uh, um, gas against civilians in, in connection with fighting the Kurdish guerrillas in the 80s, um, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, repeating periods of, of uh, civil war and uh, genocide, even worse than what has happened more recently in Darfur. So part of the problem is that people tend to forget how horrible uh, this period was. Of course there are genocides and, and this horrible massacres also in, in the civil wars of, of the later decades, like in Rwanda, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Darfur, and so on. But on average, uh, the Cold War was much worse in, in, in this world. Uh, 
And then here we have uh, the average force displacement taking place in the interstate armed conflicts of the world. And here I'm showing the years 1980 to 2005 because we have the best data for that period. So here we're looking at the number of new forced migrants produced in countries in conflict each year. Of course, the total number of people um, being displaced tends to accumulate over time uh, and increase because some people are, people are not uh, um, able to return home for a long time. Uh, one of the most extreme examples, of course, are the Palestinians. There are millions of Palestinian people still not being able to return home and counted as, as refugees. But if we want to look at how atrocious um, the civil wars of today are, we must look at the number of new forced migrants produced uh, in every year. Uh, so this is the average number of new forced migrants produced uh, in the civil wars, including the internally displaced people, those who flee within the country, and external refugees, those who have to cross the border. And here, again, we can see that the Cold War period was worse. Um, there is, seems to be a peak, a peak in intensity around uh, the end of the Cold War, just like uh, when it comes to the number of armed conflicts. And uh, of course, we have seen in the media and so on these uh, floods of refugees in recent conflicts, such as in Darfur or in, in Liberia in 1990, in Iraq recently, and so on. But again, uh, things were on average even worse during the Cold War, during the 80s. We have uh, Iran. Angola, Afghanistan. Afghanistan was much, much worse in the 1980s than now. Uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and, and so on. So again, I think it is useful to, to uh, remind ourselves uh, how bad uh, the Cold War was, how intense it was. And uh, why this is important, uh, I think, um, well, it's important because we have to analyze in detail the causes of forced migration and, and genocides and, and so on. But I think it's also important for the general impression that people might have, and especially decision makers, that if everything is getting worse and worse, why should we invest in peacekeeping and, and for, uh, conflict sensitive foreign aid and mediation and so on? So um, some people tend to get upset when we uh, present this kind of uh, information. Uh, because feeling perhaps somehow that we undermine the ability to, to uh, get people to be willing to pay for these kind of things. But I think it's actually the other way around. By way of showing that, that uh, these things such as peacekeeping and conflict sensitive development, cooperation and mediation and, and good offices and so on might work, that's the way of convincing people of how important it is to do more. Thank you, Eric. Um, now, uh, just building on what Eric just said, uh, let's go to another picture, our last picture, to say, well, something is happening to this. And what you have here is a very simple way of saying the world is getting engaged and involved in a new way with these kind of situations. Uh, and the argument is here, very much developed by Andrew Mack, that it has really an effect. So what you have here are a very simple way of seeing uh, what the world is doing about things. Uh, namely, just counting the number of resolutions passed in the Security Council. Now, the Security Council is supposed to be the one that has the chief responsibility for maintaining international peace and security. Uh, so, here we can then see uh, the Security Council, these are the number of resolutions here in the 50s, 60s. You see very few. It doesn't come about 20 in a year. Uh, only, only only in a few years it does. Most of the time it's down here, around 10 or so in a year. Now if you think about that, we have the Security Council. It's supposed to meet and deal with the world crisis. Uh, but if you only make 20 decisions in a year, that means you make uh, approximately one or two a month. It's not a very high level of activity. And in particular, if you compare it to the curve you showed with the increasing number of armed conflicts going up here, whereas the UN continues to be down here, not really parallel responding. And you can even uh, look at uh, the red line here, which are the number of vetoes uh, 
you will find that in certain periods in the 1950s there were more vetoes on presented resolutions than actual decisions. And the vetoes then continue to be a problem. Here in this period it is a, made mostly the Soviet Union. From here on it mostly the Western countries. Uh, so uh, the UN is extremely inactive. And that is even more borne home if you look at those that are under Chapter 7. The UN buffs in the, the auditorium will know that Chapter 7 are those resolutions that are binding for the members. And you will see that in the blue line here, a very few binding decisions. There is one here, uh, there is one here, uh, there is one here. This is South Africa, this is on South Rhodesia. It's almost nothing. So they're not they're making, even if they are deliberating and making decisions, these are very, uh, very weak decisions. So I think what we see here is that the, the UN was inactive, it was paralyzed by this, uh, the situation in the Cold War. Uh, some secretary generals could use this to act. Uh, some other organization might have acted, but the Cold War in itself uh, uh, made the work of the UN really impossible. And then you see a shift here, a very dramatic shift. And you can actually date it. You can date it to the 2nd of August in 1990. <coughs> uh, what happened on the 2nd of August 1990? Well, it's almost 20 years ago. That's when Iraq invaded Kuwait. <coughs> Iraq, of course, and Saddam Hussein lived in this period. He thought that this is what will happen. The UN will not react. But it surprisingly did. The Soviet Union then, Gorbachev, made a deal with George Bush Sr. Uh, and they activated the UN. And since then, this, with this sort of success uh, of action, of unity, consensus, you get a completely new picture of the Security Council. So here, they are making decisions at the rate of at least uh, 50 a year, that means once a week. It means basically the Security Council is acting continuously. You can, we can still debate whether it's effective reaction, but it is definitely much more reaction than before. And they are making decisions in a completely new way. As you see, the vetoes going down, vetoes are almost unheard of. And you can see they are, are completely predictable. You only get a veto in two kinds of situations. It is something that is too critical of Israel, the United States will block it. And if it has an implication for Taiwan, China will block it. But otherwise, uh, uh, the culture has changed. And you see that most markedly in the rise of resolutions under Chapter 7, which are the binding ones. So today, about half of all the decisions are binding. And that means the UN, as an indication of international community action, tries to deal with many of these conflicts. And as Eric and others have mentioned, this means peacekeeping operations, it means imposing sanctions, it means sending out envoys, it means supporting peace agreements. And I think that's, uh, in line with the argument of Andy, uh, a, a possible explanation why we have this downturn in our conflict. The international community is simply reacting more than it did before. And, and that kind of reaction in the long run has an impact, as Ideal also mentioned. So, uh, I think this is an indication of an increased activation of the international community. Uh, and maybe this is one of the explanations why we, we have this myth of the world getting worse. It is as our standards have become higher. We are now, we, the world in general, is not willing to accept the amount of killings that we saw during the Cold War. During the Cold War, this could all be brushed away and said, this is part of the Cold War, these are we and them, and so we are not concerned about the people being killed. Today, in a different way, we are concerned about the people being killed. And although fewer people are being killed, it now hurts us more because we have that uh, identification, a different way of seeing this. This is not what the world should look like, and uh, we have a little more of instruments to act to that, uh, in particular, uh, the UN, but also the European Union, also neighboring countries react more, or a lot of initiatives. This is also a period with a tremendous group of non-governmental organizations, and uh, I do believe that all these things do matter in the long run, and that might be the, the kind of good news we could communicate here. Myths are there, myths can be busted, and we are actually busting them, not just through research, but through being active, dealing with these conflicts. Thank you. The panel that we have up here includes Larry Kedeman, who you already know.
Uh, he will give a brief introduction to this panel's theme, Ethnic Grievances and Civil War, with background in some of the research that has been carried out within this uh, research project. In addition, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Ben Dibingen, who is a senior advisor with the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also Oskar Eilhamid, who is the director of the evaluation department at the Norwegian Agency for Development and Cooperation, and Nordic. And finally, we have Eric Lander from Uppsala uh, to moderate to the, the debate. Perfect. Thank you, Albert. It's all greed rather than grievance. Few propositions have gained as much prominence in the recent civil war literature as this uh, bold claim. Indeed, the conclusion drawn in some of the most influential research is that ethnic group frustrations do not drive patterns of uh, political violence. Not that it's because it has been directly sponsored by the World Bank. Uh, I then told, it, told us some of, about some of the details on this. This research has had a major impact well beyond academic circles. In a nutshell, researchers argue that ethnic grievances are too widespread to be linked to international, uh, sorry, internal conflict. To a large extent, however, uh, this ubiquity of grievances argument remains an untested assumption. The problem is that grievances, including those stemming from political exclusion and economic inequality along ethnic lines, are notoriously difficult to measure directly and systematically. The indicators used in the current literature, such as the so-called ethno-linguistic fractionization index or the Gini coefficient of inequality, capture interactions among individuals but say little or nothing about group-level conflict processes. Rather than being an individualist phenomenon, however, ethno-nationalist civil wars are fought between states and rebel organizations that claim to represent and are actually uh, supported by ethnic groups. Moreover, the conventional measures of ethnicity are merely demographic and therefore never try to differentiate between groups that are included in the government and those that are not. Uh, in contrast to ethnicity, nationalism is by definition about uh, access to state power. While it is hard to capture grievances directly, it is possible to identify structural situations in which ethno-nationalist violence might be especially likely. Where, uh, wherever ethnically distinct populations are ruled, by governments perceived to be foreign, uh, the principle of nationalism is by definition violated, viewed as being profoundly unjust by those excluded from power. Such situations bring forth collective emotions of resentment that can be exploited by rebel organizations uh, to challenge the state. In such situations, the risk of violence increases uh, substantially, as illustrated by the conflicts that brought down the Ottoman uh, and Habsburg empires in the early 20th century uh, and the European colonial empires during the second half of the uh, same century. Focusing on civil wars in sovereign states after the end of uh, World War II, our research show, shows that uh, groups excluded from influence over the executive, especially those whose power was recently reduced or entirely blocked, are much more likely to engage in civil violence than those that enjoy secure uh, access to state power. Uh, our new data set, Ethnic Power Relations, EPR, which emerged from a collaborative venture involving researchers at ETH, uh, Zurich and uh, UCLA uh, provides information about the power status of all politically relevant ethnic groups around the world from 1945 through 2005. A simple tabulation, as you see here, uh, of conflict probability for excluded and uh, uh, for included and excluded groups shows clearly that access to power matters. 
uh, the table displays the number of years that the groups experience peace and outbreaks of conflict. Clearly, the annual odds of civil war for any groups uh, for any group uh, are indeed very low, indeed uh, not much more than one in 170. However, an excluded group is about twice as likely to get involved in conflict as one that already enjoys access to state power. So this is what you see if you compare the uh, column here, uh, these numbers. Uh, um, the right hand, in the right hand column, you see the percentages, the conflict probability. And if you move from this, uh, this row of the included groups down to the excluded groups, you see a dramatic change, uh, the doubling of the conflict probability. And this gets even more marked if you uh, consider the subgroup of the excluded groups that have recently, recently been downgraded, that is, thrown out of government. Uh, during the two previous years. Uh, this is where you get a, a dramatic 18 time, times explosion of conflict probability. In addition to political exclusion, the relative wealth of ethnic groups uh, influences uh, the probability of conflict. Here, grievances emanate from resentment uh, linked to backwardness or in the case of relatively affluent groups, frustration uh, with having to support less effective parts of the state. But it is notoriously difficult to find data on relative wealth at uh, the group level. You would have thought that the economists would have a big reservoir of data that you could just tap into. But, uh, basically, tough luck if you thought that you have to do all the work on your own. And that's indeed what we have been spending a lot of time on uh, recently. To solve this problem, our research team adopted a spatial approach that estimates that regional income based on geographic data on economic wealth that was taken from the Nordhaus data set at Yale. Uh, our most recent data set, uh, GeoEPR, offers a bird's eye view of ethnic settlements around the world that builds directly on the EPR data set. Using the geocode settlement areas as so-called cookie cutters, we computed the relative wealth of ethnic groups since 1990, measuring horizontal inequality, that is group level inequality, as a ratio between the per capita income of the group uh, compared to uh, the average of the country as a whole. The following illustration now shows the estimate of uh, Yugoslavia in 1990, as you can see here, uh, you have the uh, Nordhaus data here, and here is the, as I say, what we have used, where we have used these cookie cutters to estimate the level of wealth in different, for different groups in uh, the former Yugoslavia, and the bluer the area, the more wealthy the region or the group, and the redder the uh, group, the, uh, so it's like more impoverished it is. Uh, and here you can see obviously that the, the rich groups are, are up here, the Croats and Slovenes, and for instance the Albanians in Kosovo are among uh, the least wealthy. So based on, on these uh, calculations, we can now start to uh, compare this with conflict data. And the, in other words, this relationship can be illustrated with the simple graph depicting the annual conflict probability of different levels of inequality, again, again with ratios below and above uh, the country average. And basically what you have here on the y-axis is the conflict probability from zero up to 0 0.02, 0.04, etc. cetera. Uh, and here is equality. So the groups that are totally equal as if they have no uh, additional uh, risk of conflict, or to say that they uh, are at a very low base level of risk, but as you start, start to deviate towards the poorer groups or the wealthy groups, the conflict probability increases. And here you also see the comparison for included and excluded groups, uh, so they fold into this diagram 
Needless to say, not all excluded or unequal groups resort to arms. Generally, the larger and more powerful the group, the more likely rebellion becomes, although this effect may decrease for very large groups. Ethnic minority rule, as illustrated by southern states, Iraq, uh, or the Tutsi government in Burundi, is an especially unstable arrangement since their lacking legitimacy has to be compensated by military domination that is likely to spawn even more grievances. But we're working on the uh, exact uh, probabilities when it comes to size dependence, and this is still work in progress. Furthermore, the influence of ethnic nationalist grievances uh, is by no means limited to political and uh, economic marginalization. It can be assumed that grievances uh, increase as the state's control of territory in question, uh, the territory in question decreases. So opposition to the government's policies typically emerges in peripheral areas, uh, far from the capital and in rough terrain as illustrated uh, by the Assamese, uh, the Chechens, the Kurdish, and so it is in India, Russia, and Turkey, respectively. Uh, in fact, this uh, harks back to uh, classical theory that was pioneered by Stein Rogan. I just had to mention this since we are here uh, <laughs> at Priyu. Uh, now, very, a very important remark here. Uh, it's, what we're not saying is that it's grievances stupid. It, uh, so we're not trying to throw out the greed factor. Uh, civil wars are also caused by several factors, not directly linked to grievances, of course. Uh, many conflicts of this type start for ideological reasons and have little or nothing to do with ethnicity and nationalism. Moreover, ethnic nationalist grievances do not exclude the possibility that such conflicts are also partly driven by material or institutional uh, logics, such as national resources, resources and wealth mostly unrelated to ethno-nationalist problems. But why does all this matter? Let me just end on a few notes about why this is important, uh, beyond you know, getting published in this or that journal. It may seem that the issue of grievances and violence is indeed merely academic, yet very much as successful medical treatments hinge on proper diagnosis, Conventional methods of conflict resolution depend directly on how the causes of conflict are analyzed. If ethno-nationalist claims were both ubiquitous and irrelevant for conflict, and possibly even used as smoke screens by greedy warlords, then there would be little reason to take them seriously. Indeed, we should uh, focus on ways to prop up weak governments and to help them improve their counterinsurgency campaigns, if that were the correct conclusion. In fact, some state leaders do uh, not even admit that they are dealing with ethno-nationalist challenges. Indeed, they are, have been keen on following for the former US President George W. Bush in referring to the uh, belligerent minorities as terrorists, regardless of their political program. In view of our findings, however, such policies are likely to be ineffective and possibly even counterproductive, especially in the long run, if they uh, focus merely on to say, suppressing insurgencies without looking at the reasons. The best way of breaking the cycle of violence driven by political exclusion is to include groups that have badly, been badly treated by the governments and to give them uh, a real stake in their country's future. Indeed, some of the most intractable and damaging conflicts uh, or in, in the current world, such as the Israeli-Palestinian uh, civil war, are to a large extent about political and economic injustice. Uh, it is thus very improbable that such conflicts will ever be resolved if the claims of marginalized populations are not taken seriously. Of course, inclusion through power sharing can be extremely fragile and often fails, as shown by uh, other members of the government. Uh, network, especially uh, if they are implemented in uh, a climate of acute mistrust, and they may even uh, provoke renewed violence. But and in some cases, partition may uh, actually be the only way to satisfy competing ethno-nationalist claims. But regardless of, of the mix of policy pres prescriptions allocated, uh, we uh, should 
legally attempts to trivialize and even criminalize grievances to ruthless state and rebel leaders. Okay. Thank you very much. And now um, I give the word to our two commentators, and um, they will give some brief comments so that there will also be time for discussion uh, with all of us. And in the order of the program, I first give the word to Dan uh, Thank you. Uh, let me start by thanking the organizers for actually inviting me. Uh, I am um, personally attached to a new construction in the region of the Department of the Ministry called the Section for South Asia and Afghanistan. Formerly, I used to work with the Section for Peace and Reconciliation, and I was responsible for our little research grant, and I presume that is why I have been invited here. So I, for the sake of good order, let me just highlight that I am, what I'm going to say is my own observations and not anything that is uh, representative of some sort of uh, general thinking within the Peace and Conciliation section as such. They are otherwise engaged, as you might have noticed, there's the, the uh, annual Oslo Forum going on, which has been quite uh, demanding on many of us for the last few weeks, so we have not tested our re respective positions on the same level. Uh, but um, in order to satisfy Scott, who then claimed that I was supposed to say something about the, the extent to which research impacts on policy decisions, let me start with that. Uh, I think, um, as you may be aware, there has for a few years been a research grant that has been located in the Peace and Reconciliation section, which is, uh, it's not very big, it's about 30 million crowns a year, and it's supposed to, to be catalytic in its, uh, in its effect, to the extent that it could either allow research institutions to um, expand on problems that they have been grappling with, uh, but not manage to actually look systematically at within the kind of research grant that they get from other research foundations, like the Research Council in Norway, or it can be some sort of vehicle by which they want to test propositions that they could then expand and ask and formulate into more coherent programs at a later stage. Secondly, there is a third provision to this research grant, which is we can actually use it to commission work which is then supposed to build critical mass around various processes where Norway is actually already engaged when it comes to trying to um, reconcile conflicting parties, or where we realize that at some future stage there might be requests for Norwegian engagement in trying to, to achieve the same uh, reconciliation efforts. Uh, the short answer to, to Scott's concern is yes, it does impact. But it does so not necessarily in any linear form. So let me then just try to, to highlight where are we? What are the sort of the various uh, actors that we have to consider in this? And with the, I have to simplify, but I, I hope that I am not going to come forward as being simplistic because that's not uh, really what I want to achieve. But at least we're two actors, and there are these three arenas. There are four rhythms, I think, of impacting, and there is, uh, in addition, the kind of surprising factor that you will find that the impact comes in surprising ways very often, rather than in very direct shifting in positions from our foremost politicians' uh, ways of arguing the dilemmas that we have to, to grapple with every day. Now, what, the two institutions are the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the academic uh, world, which is here represented by Brio. They differ fundamentally in various ways. First of all, the ministry is, by nature, a bureaucratic institution. It is a hierarchical arrangement. It is, uh, to some extent, um, it, it's definitely bureaucratic, and it is, to some extent, therefore, also, by necessity, defensive. While the academic world, and hereby again, PRIO can work in, from the opposite position. It is, you're supposed to be out there in the world, you're to, supposed to test our positions, and you are you know, desperately seeking the truth somehow. <coughs> and then there are various arenas. One is uh, the one which engages the ministry as represented by the minister. That is what uh, equalizes, I think, in classical rhetorics, the um, the uh, discussion by, between enlightened people on high issues, 
um, in high places. And then you have arenas like this where we can be invited, but where I must admit I cannot contribute anything which by far resembles the kind of academic stringency that Adrian was giving in his excellent uh, keynote uh, opening speech. And then we have, and I think that is what I would like to claim that where the impact is perhaps most direct, we have this institutionalized cooperation that has been, uh, that has got its most formal in, impression in the research grant, which somehow forces the bureaucratic ministry to constantly engage with the various actors in the research community. It has basically two tenets, I think. One is that uh, it, it again it somehow illustrates and replicates the kind of uh, unequal, uh, unequal um, arrangement that you have the ideas and I have the money. Then it also somehow mobilizes our thinking to the extent that in order for us to give you the money, we have to read what you produce. Now that has uh, two basic uh, outcomes. One is that um, I transcend my now my geographical focus by having to read a proposal that covers a global agenda. We have um, the year was that when I was responsible for this. We had several applications concerning Colombia, for instance, which I'm not at all familiar with. We had several several um, coming from Peru actually on power sharing arrangement in West Africa, which is not a political priority in Norwegian foreign policy at all. And we had uh, the unexpected uh, outcome that when I was sitting and reading and we were discussing the, uh, the results and the conclusions of these West Africa um, studies, we found that there was to a surprising uh, degree a, a correlation between the kind of needs we thought we would need in formulating a better policy for Norwegian engagement in Nepal, which came as a complete surprise, but which has somehow impacted on how we have designed our development cooperation with Nepal at, at the moment, and also how we try to intervene in, in um, not intervene is not the right word, but how we try to impact on and to, in, to uh, improve the Nepali actors' Uh, possibility of imagining their own future and solutions to their own problems. So I think it's uh, basically I'm very, very satisfied with this arrangement, but I do admit it's also very demanding. It's demanding and sometimes a lonely crusade to sit and be the, the kind of, uh, of your voice into the bureaucratic culture of the system. Now, having said that, let me try to, to go to uh, the more direct commentary function that I was supposed to have today. I have been working for 20 years now on conflict on, on countries in South Asia. I fully concur with the conclusions that um, that was prepared, that was presented as um, the lessons learned from the studies recently. But I'm a little. I don't think grievance is. A, I think grievance is a fair assumption for actually mobilizing politically. But I don't think that greed is portrayed in a way which is particularly productive. South Asia is, um, as has been briefly touched upon today, the, the region in, or the sub-region in the world where you have most conflicts today. What is it that drives them and what is it that characterizes them? I think uh, three things that I'd like to highlight. One is that it is, there are conflicts which are not necessarily driven by ethnic or sub-national issues, but also, also that there are conflicts that are motivated by religious differences, and there are conflicts which are spurred by Maoist ideologies. And I think the way the um, press, and that's where I differ from ideans, uh, claim that as long as you have democratic regimes and a free press, you cannot have uh, high levels of conflict, although you, you use the Maita sense reference to famine, but I think you can have, because what is what is the, the major characteristic of uh, South Asia is that you have an elite that defines what is written in the press, and this elite does not at all see these various conflict manifestations. And if they, if they see it, their reactions are invariably form, formative from a state-centered perspective.
And that's a problem, I think. And it's also, if I briefly comment on the greed perspective, I think that the, the um, culprit here is the state. It's the state that is actually the driver of the greed aspect and not those who are <coughs> rising in rebellion. This is particularly visible when you take a look at what is it that actually is happening in the central areas of India and the Maoist conflict that is unfolding there, and which the state is now starting to respond to, respond to in a way that I don't, that I think is going to disturb your statistics as to what kind of victims will we have to count in the future. Uh, it, it so happens that this uh, group of uh, tribal peoples in India has been, according to Wendy Doniger, who recently came out with a massive study of Hinduism, has been discriminated for the last 4,000 years by always being ruled by the state. They constitute about 25% of India's population, so we talk about a vast number of people. And today they happen to live in the last remnants of remote areas in India, but that is unfortunately for them also where you find the last the largest repositories of uh, iron ore, of coal, and of uranium. All ingredients that India needs in increasing uh, amounts in order to maintain her present level of uh, economic growth. So I think that uh, the launch, which was made by a lot of the of bravura uh, of Operation Greenheart, but then toned down not unlike uh, the present uh, offensive in Kandahar that we keep waiting for, is appeared to be going on, and the the, uh, the number of, uh, of casualties are growing by the day. But we see it only reflected in the in the press, at least in the uh, press in the capital um, editorial offices, when it is the Maoists who happen to be the one who have have uh, coordinated attacks and which then include a fair number of either soldiers or paramilitaries or police officers. You don't hear anything in these kind of articles on what's going on on the ground. And basically I think that in, in Asia, or in South Asia in particular, you, what is needed is actually more knowledge. And this is not only about what we know is unknown, but I think we will stumble on, stumble on very many unknowns, unknowns, if you take a more say, systematic look at how is it that people cope with their lives in these situations, which are so hard to cope with Thank you. Thank you very much for extremely interesting uh, comments, uh, both from the uh, point of view of the uh, relationship between uh, research and policy and from South Asia, and especially about how the state might drive greed and so on. Very interesting. I uh, turn over the word to our second commenter, Aspen Adam. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to comment on uh, this issue. Um, I uh, am with the evaluation department in NORA. I'm no expert on conflicts in particular. Uh, my favorite knowledge is really Africa and Africa. African uh, uh, politics, which also, of course, includes uh, conflicts. Um, I'm not a researcher, but I'm a very eager user uh, of uh, research. Uh, I think there are two issues um, in related to the presentation here. One is the question of greed versus grievance. Uh, I, the other is what ethnicity has to do uh, with these conflicts. Uh, on the first one, I, I don't find um, terms, uh, personalized terms like three very useful in uh, political uh, analysis. Uh, they can be used uh, and, 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 and are very, are very um, um, useful in describing behavior, of course, but to explain it, I think one has to uh, uh, look elsewhere. Greed is is everywhere. Greed comes with the opportunities. It's the situation uh, uh, which um, decides whether how greed is expressed. I, I find that concept um, 
uh, equal to the concept of political will, which I also find very useless in uh, political analysis, but I can come back to that at another occasion. Uh, in uh, the Africa continent, uh, in Africa, of the 47 countries south of the Sahara, 32 has, have experienced conflict uh, since 1980. So if you can't say that conflict is a normal state of affairs in African countries, it, it, is, it, is, it, it is normal that over the three decades they have been through a, con a conflict. It is um, no surprise, I think, that researchers, people will look for particular African explanations for uh, why this has been the case. I believe the traditional structures, uh, traditions and religion have been underestimated as factors when politics and development is analyzed in, in Africa. Uh, I think particularly many economic analysis, uh, and I will really include William Eastley and, and, and Paul Collier among them, they, they suffer from the lack of a deeper understanding of the African society. Uh, this doesn't mean that the ethnic divisions or ethnic cleavages explain uh, political developments. I think the question of uh, uh, ethnic background, of traditional structures, of uh, traditions, uh, is so much more than the differences or the cleavages or the conflicts between uh, various um, ethnic groups. Uh, I'm also quite skeptical to uh, the use of cross-country statistical analysis. Uh, I cannot have the feeling that if you change a bit the group criteria, the selection of countries, and the definition of the different phenomena, the results will also um, change. Um, but as, since I'm not a researcher, I'm in most cases not in a position to check that myself. But I, I see the discussion going on between the different economists and, and researchers on, on uh, these issues. Uh, but I found no reason to, to doubt the um, results which you presented here. And I, I think it is highly credible uh, that excluded groups, uh, ethnic groups, other groups, in, in particular those who have experienced recent loss of power, are much more likely to rebel, to be part of conflict than other groups. I would say it would be surprising if it wasn't uh, like that. <coughs> My question is, um, would that also uh, apply to other ways of dividing the population and, uh, according to the ethnic lines? Uh, I see there is an article by um, Gilbert University, University of Oslo, has looked at uh, regional divisions and looked at uh, which regions are advantaged and disadvantaged, uh, and also found some results um, indicating that also regionalization and regional divisions may have the same sort of, that you will find the same sort of, of, uh, of results from, from, from that. And, and religion is, of course, another issue which is coming up uh, very quickly also. You can see it developing on the African uh, continent. So, uh, so uh, I mean, the results you have shown here doesn't necessarily mean to me that it is the ethnicity in itself which is the cause. Um, in order to study that, one would have to look at uh, many different uh, uh, patterns uh, and structures, uh, uh, I would think, and the research which has been done so far hasn't managed really to uncover that these are the real root, these are real root uh, reasons for, for, for conflict. Uh, the American researcher uh, R.H. Bates uh, 
he uh, believes that it's neither ethnicity, resource curves, or the democratization, which also I both of them are mentioned, which um, are uh, the causes of the main causes of conflict. But uh, and I'm sure he's not alone about uh, that. It is uh, in the African continent the failure of the state. Uh, I'm quite convinced by that argument. If you look back these 30 years and look at the development of the African state, it is quite obvious that it is not, you know, it has not been able to satisfy the needs, to serve the needs, or even to be seen as some uh, as, as agencies that support uh, the population. Uh, I, I, I read a, a very interesting article by General Hamlin from, uh, from Mozambique, which described how local people in certain areas of Mozambique saw the representatives of state, and also donor agencies and NGOs, more, more, more as a danger than as, as a potential help to them. And I, I, I think if you bring this into that discussion, uh, you will get closer to, uh, uh, to a more thorough uh, and basic explanation, uh, I would think. But I, I can come back to, to, to those issues maybe in, in the discussion. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much for those extremely useful <coughs> comments and for bringing up things such as whether there's a risk that we miss what is potentially unique uh, with different regions and countries. If there's something that which is uniquely African that, that we fail to, to pick up in this kind of, of studies. The question of, of robustness, how robust are our results to changes in definitions and uh, coding rules and so on. And also alternative explanations, to what extent do we take into account alternative explanations for the same observed patterns such as regional effects or, or regional inequalities uh, and the role of religion and, and faith state and, and all these um, alternative or complementary explanations uh, seems really important to think about as well. So before we, we uh, let Lars Erik uh, comment on this, uh, maybe we should um, open up also for additional questions and comments. So anyone would like to add to the comments? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mokun Yavin. I'm from Simon Fraser University. Um, thank you for that interesting paper. I, I wanted to um, suggest that maybe uh, the way that greed was presented, particularly, and I sympathize with the fact that greed is a word as a as it's used in the debates, as Osborne also pointed out, might be very. Uh, unuseful when it comes to, to uh, moving towards uh, conflict resolution. But that doesn't maybe mean that with the way that it was used in, in your presentation, your short presentation, you maybe did not have time to uh, give the way <coughs> its softness that it really deserves in terms of the way we should understand it's not as greed per se, but rather as an opportunity cost and, and which in which different situation in which it, it pays off or does not pay off to rebel, in which we seem to leave, leave, leave some credibility when we talked about states and non-state groups earlier on today. Um, so I would suggest that maybe, uh, rather than to debunking the greed myth, maybe it's time to also think, maybe the, the myth that needs debunking here is that we can usefully tell um, uh, greed and grievance apart in terms of global monocausal explanations. Um, and then specifically, thinking maybe that, isn't this a, if you go into the academic debate about it, whether it is a, in, in the end, it matters actually of the, it's a question of deeper ideological differences of, of between academics in terms of assumptions, the, to what extent is that, is, it, is that primordial interest, is that identity or is it uh, uh, economic opportunity cost that matters? Um, and then relatedly to that, uh, thinking about the data sets and picking up on the, on the earlier discussion. Um, we know that uh, and in the uh, keynote earlier today we heard that the, de the debate on the importance of ethnicity or grievance and so on sort of moved along in, in terms of from the first uh, primordial kind of 
the data sets which we got from the Russian anthropologist and when they were first used towards more uh, sophisticated data sets. And your research is, is a part of that uh, sophistication where you see ethnic groups being analyzed not according to just a linguistic difference, but whether they have been excluded and so forth. And then on the other side, this data set, so the data sets are getting more massaged on the, on the dependent variable, and the independent variable we talked about is conflict. And we heard earlier today that that the assumption behind those data is that you have violence, you're collecting data on violence, which is not random violence, but is politically organized violence. <coughs> So are you in the set towards, are we going down the road where we're gradually having uh, X and Y becoming more and more the same? And, and what the, how are you worried about that? That's not, I'll stop that. Thank you. Let's take one or two more comments, and then we will give the word to Bashir, and hopefully we'll also have time for even more comments and questions after that. Yes. Well, I have a, a short question. Um, why greed may not be the cause of a conflict, that if, uh, the cause of greed, namely the presence of great resources, is at stake, whether that may not then protract the conflict. And I'm thinking of, the com if you compare Mozambique and Angola, Mozambique was a poor country and it was more possible also for the international community and others to come to an agreement rather than Angola where there were extreme riches uh, at stake. Thank you. Uh, one more, and then we'll give the word to Mark Taylor from TAFO. Um, I'm wondering if Mark Taylor could say a little bit uh, about uh, your views of, of uh, perception data with regards to the relevance for thinking about grievances. Um, I'm thinking, of course, of opinion polls and other smaller surveys that, that might uh, provide data sets that are sort of subnational um, and that can actually generate background variables that you can assess uh, uh, different particular groups. Thank you. Great. Okay, that gives me quite a lot of stuff to chew on here. I, I'm going to try to be very brief uh, to, in reverse order, uh, first about uh, um, direct measures of grievances. Uh, this is, of course, an excellent idea. We have on purpose taken this structural indirect approach because we wanted to get a handle on global patterns. And it would have been impossible to compare that kind of data across uh, states. Uh, but obviously the next step is clearly to go more deeply into the, the conflict and the type of data that you mentioned is exactly right. But also qualitative sources, uh, case studies, etc., would be absolutely essential in, in that work. Uh, now, the point about the, the resources is also very well taken. And again, uh, I should remind people that the data we showed here was primarily targeting uh, in fact, the onset or the outbreak of conflicts. And th this question was more geared toward duration. And it, it, it is clear that uh, resources actually do matter for the duration. But it's also important to keep in mind that uh, resources often operate through political agents and collectives, and ethnic groups are among these, or ethnically, uh, to say, uh, structured or supported rebel organizations. So I don't think that there's an either or issue here at all. Uh, now, especially uh, regions of the world, like certain groups in the Niger Delta, uh, are in fact very impoverished uh, and very close to uh, major resources. Uh, and this may actually, to say, fuel their grievances that they haven't been able to share in, on, in, in that world. Now, I, I think the, the point that was made about uh, in grievances is another is to say how they have been uh, put uh, against each other, or pitted against each other is a very well taken point. That could have been just as easily uh, a, a good way of phrasing uh, this myth. We, we chose to go for the irrelevance of the ethnicity story because it seems to be the more pernicious or the more lasting one in the literature, how strange is that may seem. Uh, even uh, Paul Collier has moved, moved away from the greed story uh, and talks more about opportunity costs, etc. But Paul Collier, for instance, when he talks about opportunity, it seemed to have some kind of labor market idea uh, in mind that you have fighters running around in the bush and uh, they are looking for employment opportunities. And then the state and the pol political institutions are very much pushed into the background in that kind of explanations. 
but I, I think it, it's an excellent point that, that you're making. Whether we are guilty of circularity, I think I'm less worried about that because I think we have clear uh, criteria for what we mean by political relevance. In fact, the share of all these politically relevant groups that happen to be engaged in conflict is tiny. So there can be no question that the, 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 there's no risk that we have some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence be between the two. But we are also trying to guard against endogeneity, obviously, when we do the data collection. Uh, uh, now, uh, there were excellent points made here uh, on the podium, and, and I can't respond to all of it. But, uh, uh, I would like to say something about the robustness more generally, and that is, of course, a very serious concern for anyone working with uh, statistical uh, data. Uh, I think we are on <coughs> rel relatively firm ground here because we have, uh, when we started doing our most recent coding in connection with EPR, uh, what we did was we actually conducted an online expert survey with more than 100 people uh, involved, area specialists, uh, focusing on various countries. And in, we have often more than one coder uh, looking at one country. And what we also made sure was to, to test our results with other data sets. So many of the results that you see here have been, to say, uh, also checked with respect to Ferenc group list or the famous Atlas Narod of Mira from the Soviet Union that was mentioned by the minorities at risk data. Uh, so I think we, we can uh, actually claim some robustness when, when it comes to many of, of the statements we, we have uh, made here. Um, now, uh, another interesting point here was um, about dividing populations along other lines, and a very important point. Uh, and we have actually some ongoing research. Uh, Krista Dijvix, uh, who is a PhD student on my team in Zurich, uh, is going to be presenting a paper tomorrow uh, because we have another workshop for those who are really uh, interested in all these, in the nitty gritty academic details. Uh, you are most welcome to attend that part of, of this conference as well. And Krista has uh, collected uh, GIS data on federal subunits. Uh, around the world uh, <coughs> using uh, GIS. And uh, we have uh, been able to find the same kind of inequality results with respect to federal subunits uh, as we did with the group level data. So that at least partly, I hope, that answers uh, your question. But I don't want to monopolize the discussion here, so I, we can come back. If I overlooked some question, please remind me uh, that perhaps there are another question. which uh, concerns another misconception, perhaps, or a myth uh, concerning civil war, namely the supposedly um, state-centeredness uh, or the state-fixed aspects of, of civil war. Uh, this panel is, is uh, introduced by Professor Chris Jostedevich. He is with the uh, uh, Department of Government at the University of Essex. He is the principal investigator for the English node of this Skirnet project, and he will uh, introduce the topic of this panel based in part on, on research carried out within this uh, research network. In addition, I'm very happy to introduce Mark Taylor. He is the Deputy Managing Director of the Institute for Labour and Social Research, FAFU. And in addition, we also have our very own uh, Christian Bergerkirchen. And I'm also happy to have Aydin Salahian as moderator for this panel. Thank you, Halvor. So, as Halvor mentioned, the myth that I would try to tackle today is the claim or common belief that civil wars primarily are national or domestic events. So, by definition, wars are challenges to state authority, and civil wars differ from many state wars in that the challengers are not states, but actors um, typically within a country's own border. And so it's not surprising in this respect that most research on civil war has tended to look for domestic factors or mechanisms to explain the uh, outbreak of civil war and how civil wars evolved. The issue of whether the myths that we've identified as strawmen 
is very pertinent in this case. I suspect that the two panelists do not for one believe that civil wars are exclusively national events. However, I don't think that the claim that civil wars are domestic event is a straw man in the sense that it is quite common in the academic literature to look at civil war as an exclusive um, um, country level phenomenon. And there's a strong tendency in academic research to treat each state or conflict as an isolated unit and to look at individual conflicts as being independent of one another. The uh, guiding line in our project is to take a contrary perspective and apply a transnational perspective on civil war. And that implies that we look specifically at linkages between countries, we look at actors that are transnational, and we think about how events that transcend national boundaries or events in other countries can have important influences on the risk of conflict and how it evolves. So it's obviously not possible to summarize everything that we've done in a three-year project in the scope of 10 minutes, but I'd like to highlight three particular issues that we worked on where it's easy to see how the transnational perspective is important for civil wars. The first one pertains to how the actors that are involved in conflict often have a transnational presence. The second deals with how border areas or the boundaries of states become very important uh, situations of fighting in conflict and also provide particular opportunities and challenges for conflict. And the third point is how civil wars in one uh, country uh, create implications for other states. So we could have diffusion effects and there may also be international security problems that emanate from civil wars that are not purely domestic. So, the first way to appreciate the international dimension of civil war is simply to look at a map of where the outbreaks of civil wars occur. And so what we have on this map is an indication of all the events since 1945. The red circles are uh, conventional civil wars, whereas the grey squares are internationalised civil wars, by which we mean that there's some state that intervenes on behalf of the state side in a conflict. And the key take-home point here is that if you look at this map, we can see a clear evidence of clustering or overrepresentation of conflict in certain time periods. If we partition this in time, we would see an even stronger effect. There are certain areas, such as the Caucasus or West Africa, where we have a large number of simultaneous outbreaks of civil war in neighboring countries. And this very strongly suggests that individual civil wars are not independent of one another, but that the risk of conflict in one country is highly dependent on what takes place in other states and whether they are involved in conflict. It's also possible to show this more formally, and it's not the case that clustering disappears when we take into account other state characteristics that must be clustered. So this clustering is then a very real phenomenon, and it's highly suggestive that international factors may be important, although it obviously is less telling with respect to what the underlying mechanisms here might be. So what I'd like to do today is to start with a specific example of a conflict with the transnational um, dimensions are easy to identify, and, and you could easily make the case that conflict would have been unlikely if not for these transnational linkages. And then what I'm going to do then is to try to show that this is not a one-off case, but that it's possible to find more systematic evidence of these things applying. So the incidents that I would like to talk a little bit about is a 2001 Albanian revolt in Macedonia. In many ways, this is a difficult case for the conventional uh, closed polity model of civil war because it doesn't seem to be a good fit with conventional explanations. So we know that young states are more prone to civil wars, but Macedonia became independent in 1991, and here conflict occurs 10 years after independence, when the state is already much better consolidated. Likewise, we know that exclusion is an important factor in civil war, and it's certainly the case that Albanians may be marginalized in a predominantly Slav nation state. But the outbreak of conflict here actually follows in a period where the Albanian minority were given more concessions and political influence. In this case, looking at the transnational component is very helpful to understand the context for the outbreak of the conflict. So we know that the Albanians are a transnational group. They're present in uh, Albania, as well as in the neighboring province <coughs> of what was at the time Yugoslavia. And we also know, if you look at the timing, that the outbreak of this insurgency followed closely from the previous war in Kosovo. And indeed, if we look more uh, in particular at where the events occurred, we will find that uh, 
finding promoted to place in border areas. And there's strong evidence that previous units that have been active in Kosovo more or less uh, uh, directly marched into the Macedonian conflict. We also see that the bases are located primarily in border areas. And the rebels took advantage of the bordering area to escape Macedonian forces and also operated other bases in Kosovo. So that suggested that in cases where Russian national components, the resources that actually could mobilize is much more than what we could see at the national level. And these kind of resources may also be more difficult to target for nation states because they extend beyond the borders of their sovereignty. So this is clearly a case where transnational factors seem very important. Indeed, it is possible to argue the conflict would have been unlikely if not for the transnational linkages and the previous event in Kosovo. But is this simply a um, unique example, or is it indicative of more general tendencies? So in our project, we've done a number of studies um, that strongly suggest that transnational characteristics have a more general influence on the risk of conflict. One relatively simple example is a paper by uh, Lars Eric Sedeman, Luxia, Dan, and myself, where we extend the transnational model of ethnic conflict that Lars Eric talked about in his panel. And the question that we put is simply that if a group has transnational segments, that is, if it has individuals in neighboring countries, are we more likely to see conflict based on what we would expect from the domestic characteristic of a group? The results strongly attest to, um, to this uh, question. So just to give it a sense of what you're looking at here, what you're looking at here is the risk of conflict onset over the period for a group based on the relative size of the group to the ethnic group with power in the country. And we know that groups with more resources, larger groups, are more likely to rebel. Yet the result showed that there's a strong divergence between the predictions for a purely uh, domestic group, which is given by the red dashed line, and that of a group with transnational segments, which is given by the black solid line. So to give you a numerical example to put this in perspective, consider the case of the Kurds in Turkey. Um, here, the relative group size is about 0.14 as there are about one Kurd for every uh, seven Turks. So if this had been a Kurdish domestic group, as you can see from the red dash line, the likelihood that we would see a conflict over the period would have been about 20%. But since this group has transnational segments in other areas like Iraq and Syria, uh, the model returns a much higher predicted probability, indeed double of what we would see uh, from the purely uh, domestic um, predictions. And what we know about this conflict suggests that these features indeed have been very important. Indeed, there's been a lot of fighting in border areas. The uh, uh, rebel movement has operated out of bases in neighboring countries. And the conflict is also helpful in that it illustrates <coughs> the potential for civil wars to create tension between states and the likelihood that we will see escalation across state boundaries. We have other papers that have looked at uh, the connections between civil war and international uh, conflict, um, an article in JCR written by Aideen and myself, and Aideen's book on transnational rebels also go into this phenomenon in a lot of detail. I'd like to close with a couple of remarks about the broader implication of the project. We're certainly not arguing that domestic factors are unimportant, but we think that the transnational dimension is an important factor that often modifies the effect of the purely transnational features. So in this sense, we believe that our results demolishes some of the common claims about the exclusive importance of domestic factors. Indeed, from an academic point of view, this provides misleading um, foundations. And in a practical sense, it can often suggest policy implications that may be inappropriate. But I think the transnational linkages are also important for policy responses, particularly with respect to what other countries or third parties may do. On the one hand, these transnational linkages suggest some challenges for peacekeeping operation. So we're unlikely to have successful peacekeeping operation unless we have some kind of um, cooperation with other neighboring countries and unless the security implications for neighboring countries are taken into account. But the transnational linkages also suggest some additional opportunities and perhaps additional uh, ways by which either peacekeeping or conflict preventing measures may be effective. 
In particular, there's some evidence that groups that have transnational segments are not only more likely to be involved in conflict, but also have better chance of getting concessions from government. So these kind of transnational linkages could also facilitate things that would avert conflict. Now, neighboring states may be more at risk of negative spillovers, but that on the other hand also suggests opportunities. There may be uh, additional ways to find these to have a constructive role in peacekeeping operation and perhaps play a larger role in financing conflict preventing measures. So in that sense, the presentation ends on a positive note. Uh, although our research hasn't looked that much at peacekeeping at the present, it suggests important characteristics um, that could tell us something about the prospects for such engagement. And it also suggests opportunities for other countries to act from a policy perspective. <clears throat> okay, wonderful. Well, first we'll hear from uh, Mark Taylor from FAPO, and um, following that, we'll <coughs> begin uh, from here at PRIO. We'll offer some comments and reflections, and then we'll open it uh, for uh, questions from the audience. Okay, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you um, uh, to uh, PRIO and the Center and, and their, their colleagues in the Road Network for the invitation. Uh, it's not often that I get the chance. Um, to engage with uh, with some of these uh, debates, particularly the although I work at an institute, uh, FAFO, that does a lot of work in generating data, um, uh, it's not often that I get a chance to to actually engage with those doing so much of, of the analysis. Um, a lot of the, the work that uh, that FAFO does is is either straight ahead survey work, or, um, qualitative research in in uh, these sorts of countries, uh, conflict countries. Um, or a combination of, of the two. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is based on, on the qualitative work that I've been involved with in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, particularly with respect to, to the work I'm doing now on armed groups uh, in Palestine, but also on um, the larger question of uh, the law and policy um, uh, issues around regulating the commercial dimensions of armed conflict. And so my starting point is a little bit different from, from Christian's. Um, which is that I'm, I'm, to a certain extent, less interested about um, uh, the extent to which uh, domestic factors alone explain outbreak. Um, I'm particularly interested in the ways in which transnational factors help sustain armed conflict, uh, particularly through the provision or, or the supply of war fighting capacity. Um, and what I'd like to do is, <coughs> is. Um, uh, in fact, when I saw the, the myth on the uh, on the agenda, my initial thought was was um, uh, is there a bit of a uh, I'm not sure this is the right term, but is there a bit of selection bias here? Because so many of the data sets are are generated by states um, that we automatically, uh, when doing the quantitative analysis, uh, and I know this also from our own work at Falcon, we automatically sort of tend to want to focus on on the role of the state. Uh, but what I'd like to to do is is, is say that that uh, is look a little bit at the ways that. Um, uh, domestic factors uh, or conflicts are not restricted uh, within state boundaries and suggest four areas in which to, to, to look for these. Um, or in other words, the ways that these conflicts are, are transnational. Um, and I think that these also help us understand uh, some of the, these sort of four areas of uh, what I would call regula regulation uh, with a small r are also ways that, uh, a way to help us understand the policy mix that, that might help us respond. Um, so the first is the one that we talked about earlier um, earlier today, which is, uh, which is the commercial dimensions, what I will generally call the category of markets. This includes the illicit exploitation, um, people refer to criminal economies and so on earlier before, lootable resources, the, the classic examples being uh, today being uh, Eastern DRC. Um, but it also includes uh, trade routes, uh, and, the cr and the crucial ways in which those routes um, help to regionalize uh, uh, domestic uh, conflicts. I think that there's um, a, a real interaction, a reflexive relationship that is happening there. And it's not just the illicit exploitation of natural resources. Um, it extends to uh, pretty much anything uh, that can be uh, uh, traded, uh, from human beings to agricultural commodities, um, cattle, uh, etc. And we see this all over the world. Transboundary movements of these commodities is crucial in helping uh, to both sustain households um, as well as in helping to sustain the war fighting capacity of, of the armed groups involved, both governmental and, and non-governmental. And it is that formal, informal trade integration that really matters here with respect to, to markets and 
Um, the second is, is what I'll call architecture, or, or the sort of materiality uh, of, uh, of the materiality as a, as a kind of regulator. Um, this matters, for example, for the, the first problem I mentioned, markets. Uh, it really matters the nature of the resource you're trading, the nature of the commodity you're trading, um, as to what is, uh, uh, as to the nature of your trans, your trans boundary relationships. It matters that if you're in an area where you're bunkering oil, or whether you're um, extracting diamonds or, or timber, or whether you're moving people from cigarettes, these things affect the nature of the, of the market relations. Um, but they also, um, it also matters, as Christian pointed out, whether you're in a, whether you're in a border area. Um, the nature of the lie of the land, the, the, the line drawn on the map, uh, has any relationship to, to the, the lie of the land that, that you're fighting in. So it has tactical um, aspects as well. If your ease of access to transboundary movements uh, has a direct relationship on, on uh, your ability to, to, sustain, to sustain the fight. Thirdly is what I generally call uh, social norms. And, and this is something where I think um, the work that's been done on, on migration, which is obviously a transboundary phenomenon, has a direct relationship, or, or at least can help inform the, the, the work done on mobilization uh, of armed groups. Um, in the work on the West Bank and Gaza that, that I'm finishing up now, the, the, what we're seeing is that the, the mobilization of armed groups is a, is a deeply socialized phenomenon that there is really very local, uh, right down to right down to the block, uh, uh, you know, streets, block level, uh, the neighborhood level. Um, it is generational. It is uh, um, uh, tribal in the sense of clans or amulets in the Arabic. Um, and it is, yes, also political. Um, and what we see, at least in Palestine, is that Issues of religion and, and ideology that were mentioned this morning are really heavily, heavily mediated by the, the, the factions in terms of their, their effect. And I would argue that all of these um, interact with a much larger phenomenon that, that I think is only really raised by one or two historians, some of the prominent historians of the 20th century, people like Hobsbawm and others, which is really a, a globalized norm of, of resistance. I think that, that increasingly we're facing situations in which uh, by the end of the 20th century uh, that norm of self-determination self that was unleashed after the First World War has, has really become uh, one in which people simply will not be governed. And that, is, that, is, and that leads to the point I raised in my earlier uh, question about uh, perception data, because that relationship to the state is important in different ways, whether it's, whether it's in Norway or, or Denmark or in China. The ability of the regime in China to, to maintain legitimacy is a crucial challenge. And so, um, just to sort of put that out there, that, that there, there's probably, a, to my knowledge, a, an as yet untapped data resource in, uh, uh, in the perception data, something that we're working with over, and have piloted over time in the West Bank and Gaza with a series of calls since 2005, as well as a lot of qualitative uh, research, looking at issues of political trust as a form of social capital. So the final one um, uh, is one of, uh, the, the final sort of category or element of regulation is the most obvious one, which is law. And here I just want to mention a couple of things, which is that um, uh, uh, I think what we're seeing internationally um, is the emergence of a, of a transnational legal approach to, on the one hand, exclude crimes and war crimes and criminals from our own domestic jurisdiction. And on the other hand, to exclude um, uh, a certain kinds of, of, um, of criminal behavior from uh, value chains. In other words, sort of ethical values of, of production as advanced through uh, business and human rights, CSR, and so on. And I think thinking about this uh, actually is quite, you can break it down by, by, uh, by uh, the sort of capitals of, and headquarters of various international organizations. I mean, there's a, there's a Hague agenda around this, obviously. The, the ICC, uh, but more importantly, uh, um, the Hague Agenda is actually being implemented in domestic courts around the world. So what you're seeing is um, increasingly um, that countries are in fact prosecuting war criminals who are in their jurisdiction uh, because they sought asylum there. Um, this happened in Canada for the first time since ever. It happened in Norway um, two years ago for the first time since the Second World War. And this is something the United States uh, has been doing it um, a little more actively 
And, um, and it's not something that's uh, going away. It's something that is new uh, and that governments are, are uh, pursuing as a way of showing that they, are, they take international criminal law seriously with respect to the, the asylum seekers in their jurisdiction, at least. Uh, the second is the sort of New York agenda, and that, of course, is uh, Security Council and, and UN sanctions. Here, just to mention very briefly, the, the, the most recent work, most of the work that has gone forward in this area on the transnational dimensions uh, has been uh, in relation to DRC and in, and in relation to terrorism. Uh, in DRC, one of the interesting things that's happening now is that the, uh, the Council has asked the expert panels to come up with a definition of due diligence for companies operating in uh, DRC and has specifically, in its last two resolutions, um, encouraged, to use their word, member states um, to ensure that their companies are conducting due diligence when they source minerals from DRC. Um, third is the, the Geneva <coughs> Agenda, which has uh, really focused around the work of the UNSRSG on business and human rights, John Ruggie, uh, who has laid out due diligence as the core uh, of his business responsibility to human rights, but has also reinforced state responsibilities and is arguing that extraterritoriality actually isn't extraterritoriality. Uh, he's making the argument that states can be responsible when, within their own jurisdictions when their companies are based there, even if that those responsibilities have an extraterritorial effect. And finally, the, the Paris-based agenda, which is really um, the OECD, um, is in the process of strengthening um, their uh, putting up guidelines with respect to the mineral sector, also in DR Congo, um, but is also working to, to revise the multinational guidelines for multinational enterprises. And we're now seeing countries like Norway following uh, the Netherlands and Britain um, uh, in reforming what's called the National Contact Point, which is a complaints mechanism uh, for companies operating abroad. So these are all just examples of ways in which, uh, in which law, both soft and hard law, uh, are having uh, very significant uh, or potentially significant transnational effects. Um, these are not um, uh, with respect to conflict. These are, these are with respect to conflict. These are not by any means, uh, um, uh, or let me put it in the positive way, this is at the normative level, not at the level of, of, uh, of actual regulation or law that, that advice, um, but it is a huge step forward um, in the last five years uh, compared to what we faced uh, when this was top of the agenda uh, with respect to Angola, Sierra Leone, and, and other countries in, in 2001. Um, I think that these four areas that, I, that I've mentioned, uh, markets, uh, architectural materiality, social norms of the law, I think it's important to, to understand that these actually uh, um, don't just in influence each other, but actually act through each other. And so norms are being set, uh, being uh, brought into law. Norms and law are structured, and architecture are structuring economic activities or markets with respect to these different conflicts. And it's this complexity that has really stumped uh, international institutions in responding to the transnational dimensions of conflict. But I think that partly as a result of the work of many of you in, in the room, um, uh, we're getting, uh, we are in fact closer now than, than, than we have been to be able to grapple with this. Uh, Thanks. Thanks, and uh, thanks, Christian. Uh, I am a great, great admirer of this work, and I'm also a great uh, consumer of the work. That, uh, informs this uh, policy paper. So um, uh, it's also impressive, I think, that you're able to pack all those insights and the bibliography is here at the very end for those who oh, you want to read more. Many of you already have. Uh, that you've been able to pack all that into uh, these few pages. Um, of course, operational, operationalizing transnational factors for quantitative analysis is uh, it's quite a hard nut to crack. Uh, and I'm sure you know that since you have been engaging in it over a number of years. Uh, once you do start operationalizing, operationalize something as complex as this, you also leave yourself quite vulnerable to attack. So I won't, uh, I won't fall for that temptation. That's, uh, that's a bit too easy. I'd rather try to be informative and constructive. Uh, my whole work is uh, not quantitative. It's rather conceptual and empirical. Uh, much of it relates uh, to Afghanistan. So uh, on that basis, let me make uh, three uh, brief points really. The first point speaks to your first um, chapter, so to say, in, in the policy brief, uh, the chapter about uh, transnational actors. Uh, in some ways, this is also a comment, in fact, on, uh, on the presentation that uh, Rajeri had uh, in the previous session. 
there, there is something with the way we uh, easily assume that ethnic identity uh, equals uh, equals uh, groupness. That by being by sharing an ethnic identity, you are immediately a coherent whole that has some, some ability to act, which I have always found uh, quite problematic. Um, of course, here I'm drawing on, on work within sociology. I am a sociologist, I have to admit. Uh, not, not the least the work by, by great figures such as uh, Raj Tilly, but also his inspirer, uh, Harrison White, who was sort of distinguishing between the categorical identity on the one hand and the interaction, the network on the other hand, and then claiming, unless you had both of these dimensions, in other words, what they refer to as atness, shared identity, netness, being enrolled in actual interactive relationships, you don't have organization. And I, it's, it's, it's an easy insight, it's a simple insight, but it's also one that I find uh, uh, very compelling. Um, in the Afghan instance, I've been quite fascinated by ethnicity and how it is that it spills across border. Now this is a state that was originally established as a buffer state. It shares many of the characteristics we know with borders in Africa, cut across ethnic and tribal territories, and so forth. So most of the ethnic groups in Afghanistan do have their ethnic kin, if you want to use such an expression, in the neighboring countries. Nonetheless, when you start to look at the extent to which there is interaction within these ethnic groups across borders, that varies a great deal uh, for a number of reasons. One reason, I think, having to do with uh, border controls. Now, to the south, you have the Pakistan, to the south and the east, you have the Pakistani border, which has basically been uh, porous throughout history. Uh, to the west, you have the Iranian border, where there has been increasingly uh, strong policing. And to the north, you have uh, what used to be the border against the Soviet Union, which was very, very solidly controlled. And you have this going on for decades and uh, almost up to a century, if you count from, uh, if you count from from the beginning of, of the Soviet Revolution in Central Asia, then that really impacts interaction across borders. And it's very easy to assume that, that the actorness of these ethnic groups is really one and the same, but it isn't by no means. For most Tajiks living close to the border even, uh, towards Tajikistan in Afghanistan's northeast, uh, the interaction with their ethnic kin across the border is very, very limited. If you're living close to the Pakistani border in one of the tribal communities amongst the Pashtuns there, you're probably likely to see a solidarity group that spans the border as, in fact, your primary identity. So these are widely different realities. Um, that brings me to my second point, which speaks to your second point about transborder conflicts. Um, and. I have mixed feelings about your operationalization here, because on the one hand, I like the way that you bring the state back in. On the other hand, I find it, pro find it problematic that the transnational tends to become only about the role of states in supporting groups within the domestic, at the domestic scene. Uh, the reason I like it is that I find much of transnationalist literature quite problematic in not, uh, in not including the role of the state. And of course, the state is important in supporting various types of groups, whether that is groups on the domestic arena or groups that span state borders. But nonetheless, uh, I think there is something genuine about the transnational networks, which doesn't necessarily have to do with the state, that tends to, uh, at best, uh, slide into the background in, in this analysis. Uh, I've just been editing a, 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 a journal which include a paper by an original anthropologist, Alex uh, Axel Borderwink. And he's looking at the case of um, Ethiopia. And he's comp doing a comparative study of Ethiopia's borders with its three main neighbors, Somalia, Sudan, and Eritrea. And he's looking at state strength, relative state strength, between Ethiopia and the respective three neighbors. And what he's finding is that this is not only a question about whether uh, it's not only a question about Ethiopia's strength, it's really relative state strength that matters. And not only that, but in fact, Ethiopian state strength 
varies, not only relative to its neighbor, but it varies from one stretch of order to another, which I find uh, quite interesting, and which is part of the reason that I actually enjoy your emphasis uh, on the state. I've also been taken in, in recent days by a report written by a guy called Matt Waldman, published on LSE on Taliban, and uh, the Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI, which has uh, caught the headlines of, uh, of uh, many international uh, media. But of course, then again, it's jumping at the easy solution. The Taliban can all be explained by the uh, by its relationship to a foreign intelligence service, which is far, which is again far too easy, because this is actually a movement that's deeply embedded in transborder, ethnic, and religious networks, and in refugee movements, another issue that you, uh, you've been doing very interesting work on, which is uh, not necessarily much reflected in this paper. So, um, so I think that's, it's a different, difficult balancing act when one does work on, on, on this issue, and it seems to me that you're tilting slightly towards the state end, despite my strong sympathy for looking at the role the state. Um, there's also an in, well, other interesting insight, uh, which actually Sara Lischer had brought up, which is about the reasons for states supporting, uh, uh, supporting movements in a neighboring conflict, as it were. It's not only about necessarily uh, supporting actively, which is your emphasis here. It can as much be about the lack of capacity to control that movement. That's an interesting distinction, I think. And when we talk about whatever concept we want to use, failing states, weak states, it's often the case that it's not really active support that is the issue. It's just a lack of ability to prevent uh, the group from operating, or perhaps prevent rogue elements within their own administration, which is probably to quite an extent what's happening in the Pakistani case, for example, and in the Taliban. Then finally, on, on uh, policy, uh, I think as Mark said, uh, we do have a very interesting debate now on how it is that we relate to these transnational challenges. And thanks to work, thanks to your work and the work of others, I think uh, the debate is uh, increasingly well informed. I nonetheless find it somewhat problematic, and this is not a critique of your work, it's more a critique of the state of affairs in this area that when we start looking at the responses, we revert to the very state-centeredness that you talked about initially. It see, it's, a, it's as if we are not able to really imagine that the responses can lay anywhere apart from in the state. Which is a bit ironic, given that all of this is really about moving beyond state-centeredness in the first place. So, if you read much of the literature on transnational challenges to the state, then you get to the policy recommendations. The policy recommendations largely center on building a stronger state that can control its border, that can crack down on insurgents. Um, and I think your point about peacekeeping operations needing to look beyond the scope of the state is well taken. So it's not a criticism of that. The next level of analysis, which we sometimes see come out in, in its own literature on this, is to look for state-based organizations, classical multilateral organizations, whether that is on the global level or more commonly, in fact, at the moment, at the regional level. So the UN, the so-called Brahimi report, which came out in 2000, 2000 uh, has been given a lot of credit for bringing this onto the agenda. But if you read the Brahimi report, it's really only about subcontracting peacekeeping operations to the regional level, which has nothing to do with a new type of understanding of the conflict dynamic that we see playing out in terms of spillover effects, in terms of transnational factors. Um, so we still haven't, and we still haven't moved. I mean, that's, that report is 10 years old, but it still seems we haven't moved far beyond that when it comes to the policy debate. So it's like the policy debate is lagging significantly behind. And the question here, and here I certainly don't claim to have any answer, answer to this, is whether there are responses that are sort of genuinely uh, transnational in the sense of not being about the state or interstate relationships, but which has to do with fostering transnational responses, and by transnational responses here I mean responses fostered in transnational types of action and transnational types of actors. And I think that is something we need to start to look more carefully into, 
in the Afghan context to take that again and I'll end on that now. It seems to me again that this response of building the strong state is, uh, has, has largely been failed. And are there ways then in which we can actually, uh, from a third party perspective, engage with the strong religious, ethnically based, tribally based networks in uh, so that they actually become part of the response rather than part of the problem? And it strikes me, and I think this resonates with something that Peter Taylor taught said earlier that uh, the way we currently label this only as part of the problem is, in fact, uh, a large share of the problem. Thanks. Now, this panel uh, will be introduced by uh, Scott Gates, uh, who is the director for the Center for the Study of Civil War at CREO. Uh, in addition, I'm very happy to have on board this panel uh, Ingrid Sonset, who is a researcher at the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Bergen, and also uh, representing uh, Norwegian People's Aid, we have uh, Beate Thorsen, uh, who is a visual advisor, I believe, uh, at the People's Aid. Uh, and finally, uh, moderator of this session is uh, Simon Hook, uh, who is a uh, professor of political science at the University of Geneva, and also an active uh, participant and member of the Crownet uh, project. Okay, um, this is a ongoing project that uh, uh, Howard Strand, who is sitting now in the front row, and Kors Stom, who uh, is reportedly in Norway, <laughs> but he's uh, not here anymore <laughs> in Oslo. Uh, I thought he might be able to come here, but that was not the case. Anyway, uh, we've been working for quite a number of years now on, um, on power sharing arrangements and post-conflict uh, governance. And uh, we've written other policy briefs and we have a number of papers, including an edited book on uh, power sharing in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that uh, Bianca, or Benta Bingen made reference to earlier. Um, anyway, let's get into the discussion. I, I'm a little uncomfortable calling this uh, myth busting or something like that. Um, peace and democracy, can we have both? But, uh, but I think of this as basically exploring the nuances involved and also um, running against the tide to some degree. But I'm not really sure that we have a myth that we're, we're busting. Per se, but I think in the spirit of all the other presentations, I think we're right exactly what the others are doing is looking at the nuance, and I think uh, Adian's uh, keynote really well set the framework for for the direction that we at Cronet have been engaged. This is a little bit awkward while running back and forth. Is there a thing? Okay, um, basically, as I mentioned before, we're focusing on post-conflict uh, democratization, post-conflict peace building, and when we come to that, issues of governance after warfare, we're talking about institutional design. Um, and when we talk about that, we're really talking about two key elements. We're talking about democracy, and we're talking about sustainable civil peace. And I play with the word civil peace to kind of juxtaposit to civil war. But what I mean by civil peace is something that's more durable, something that's more dynamic, and it's not just a ceasefire. It's not what Galton calls a negative peace. It's something that's really a deep-seated um, uh, aspect of society where armed conflict is just not one of the things that seems the first thing to come to mind is bare arms against your, your government. Um, and what this entails is going to be robust peace agreements, and we would argue democratic governance, but beyond that, good governance, not just democracy um, and representatives. And I, and I want to make also the appeal, when we talk about democracy, we're not just talking about having an election, we're talking about a broad set of institutions that are involved. So just the mere, merely having a even a competitive election is not sufficient. Now, in the environment of conflict, 
post-conflict environment. Um, power sharing arrangements have been uh, highly advocated, um, not only in situations of post-conflict environments, but also in um, uh, violent elections, or the cases of Kenya and Zimbabwe, where elections broke out during violence. The solution to the problem and advocated by the international community from uh, powers within the United Nations, as well as George Bush during both of those cases. So there's quite disparate sources of advocacy for power sharing arrangements. And when we're talking about power sharing arrangements, I'm really focusing on inclusive uh, arrangements by which the parties, the belligerent parties, are brought into governance, given a share of power, and, um, and guaranteed some form of veto plane. It's a very light partian and sociationalist notion of inclusiveness. Okay? Now, one thing that we, we are sure is that there was a pattern by which these arrangements do build peace. I'm not convinced it's a civil peace, but they do bring, apart, bring about uh, demobilization, and you're basically providing a means by bringing the spoilers into government. And what I mean by spoilers are those who have the potential to ruin the deal, to cause and bring back violence. And what power sharing arrangements do is they bring these groups into the system and so that they have something that's guaranteed piece of the pie. Rather than fighting for all the pie, the logic is we'll give you a guaranteed piece of the pie rather than a chance for it all. Um, it's a way and a pattern for negotiating political demands in which they're obligated, either they're um, institutionalized. And the other aspect of it, as we see in the case of Northern Ireland, is that it serves to moderate extremism. And in the case of Northern Ireland, we now have a coalition government through a power sharing arrangement in which we have Sinn Féin and uh, the Ulster, it's Ian Paisley's party, the, now I'm, sorry, I've forgotten the name of that party, but it's the, the Ian Paisley, and having Martin McGuinness and Ian Paisley together in government, uh, both of their extremist tension or tendencies were moderated by the nature of the agreements. The inherent logic of an inclusive power sharing arrangement is that you basically are assuring a piece of the pie. And by doing this, you rule against political uncertainty, surprises, and the types of things, the shocks that might cause the return to violence. Everything's assured. Keep that in mind. So the positive aspects are going to also have some ramifications on the negative side we'll come to later. This is the case. Well, let me get back up here. Um, the main case for power sharing, we argue, is that it does build peace. The problems, what I want to get into, are going to regard the governance dimensions, the case against power sharing. There are two critical aspects, what I would argue and other theorists of democracy have argued about inherent aspects of democracy. One, Jaworski argues, is the um, aspects of that you don't know for sure who's going to win the elections. You just never, there's no guarantee as to who's the winner and who's the loser. There are, there are always going to be some aspect of uncertainty before the elections occur. The second aspect, which is critical, is a notion of accountability. And that's the ability to vote as what's referred to as vote the bums out. If there is poor governance, then you're going to have an election and somebody's going to be held accountable and you're going to have a, a response to that. Now the problem in pow inclusive power sharing arrangements is that you reduce the degree of accountability. You vest authority in the different communities. If you take the Lebanese example uh, as a good example, you vest it in those communities. Elections occur, but what you do is you don't have a sense of absolute accountable to individuals or, or a party in particular. Um, the second aspect of this is that you reduce the role of the electorate in determining the composition of the, of the, the relative composition 
of the power sharing government. Now, the other problem with power sharing is that it tends to favor the armed groups. Those with weapons, those that can be um, spoilers, are favored. The whole orientation of creating a peaceful environment is one in which you go out of your way to compensate for the danger that these groups have. And they have tremendous power and bargaining advantage because they have the threat to return to violence. So you bring them into government so that they're part of the government and they're for out of the, uh, uh, into the system. The problem is, in negotiating with them, you have to, in many cases, especially if they have a, a uh, what we show in one, of, not in the policy brief we have here, but in another policy brief, in situations in which a group has a higher marginal utility for fighting, you actually have to overcompensate them to get them into a power sharing agreement. What this does is it creates an environment in which you're disproportionately favoring some of the smaller groups. This case is definitely seen in the case of Burundi with the Tutsis receiving disproportionate shares as a majority, as a minority, I mean. And the majority then is feeling that they are disenfranchised and you get the development of extremist Tutu majoritarian parties because of the overcompensation for the minority Tutsis. The final problem is that power sharing arrangements tend to be static. What you do is you vest authority in certain communities. Lebanon's probably the most extreme example still linked to a 1930s, a census that was taken in the 1930s, invested um, different proportionate rates or proportions of power based on that old census. Now one could uh, update the census. The problem is what it does, even if you do update and you allow for a flexibility that Lebanon doesn't have, but you allow for some form of flexible response, differential, um, regular census, whatever the plural of census is, um, but that you would have an updating of those censuses which would allow for updating. The problem is that you still vest authority in the belligerence of the time that you started the institutional arrangement. And you don't allow, there's not an easy mechanism for the inclusion of new groups. How do you include new groups? They have to become belligerent. And this creates a problem because you incentivize creating problems to be able to get voice within the government system. And all of these problems are, in, at least in our argument, inherently not democratic. And so you have a fundamental problem is moving from conflict to peace. Power sharing does have the ingredients for making that step. But the problem of moving towards a civil peace rather than just a demobilization and a negative piece, is more problematic. So what will work? Well, from our thinking, civil society plays a critical role here. And I view this as antithetical to the inclusive nature of power sharing arrangements. It doesn't have to be, uh, but I'm going to juxtapose, this and juxtapose them just to be a little bit provocative. Um, the way I view it is, in a post-conflict environment, um, what's necessary probably is to at least take care of the security problem. And that's going to be the big, big problem in moving towards this. But if that can be done, say through UN um, uh, intervention or something like that, and that's a case that we use from Liberia, in which a preponderance of force is brought to bear, the security problem is, is Afforded. And basically, the bargaining power of the, of the militarized groups is lessened. What this provided was an environment in which you clean the slate, and not due to any pressure from international authority, especially women's groups started to, to develop and played a very, very big role in the movement towards peace in Liberia. Now, more generally, I view civil society as playing critical roles. One is as long as part of social civil society is not captured by this co the sovereign or co-opted to compete against itself, which very often happens, a uh, good leader will divide the opposition and take advantage of that situation. As long as that doesn't happen, there can be a check on sovereign authority. 
The other aspect of a dynamic and, and strong civil society is that you're balancing competing interests. That there is an environment out there for different voices to be heard. And thirdly, and I think probably the most important, is that a thriving civil society provides a dynamic source for the emergence of new elites. And often in the environment of post-conflict environment, I think this is critical. It's to move away from the old authority patterns, ones in which uh, the ability to threaten the peace and to be able to mobilize a group with arms is the means by which you get authority to moving to other pathways and new, new forms or new patterns of elite structures can emerge in a society. Not easy, and it's only going to happen if the security problem is, is addressed. And that's easier said than done. Fundamentally, I think it comes to, in what I, my point about civil society, and it's partly reflecting my own thinking on the issue, and that is, I think it's more than institutional design. Just getting the courts in session, just having an election, holding the right kind of elections, probably not enough. International society needs to be supporting grassroots activity, needs to be supporting um, organizations like women's organizations, labor movements, other forms of organization which are going to enrich civil society. And there's a role that can be played. NGOs play that role already. Official um, other types of international community can play that role. And I guess what comes to mind is a metaphor about, and often when people talk about democracy, it's as if you were on a train and there was a station that was called democracy and the train stops there and you get off and you're in democracy. And you're in democracy land or the, the town of democracy. And I don't think it is that way. I, I think democracy is something that is the engine that drives the train, and it's what you keep on moving. And unless there's some dynamicism to the society and a constant effort and vigilance against sovereign authority, I think that uh, you don't, you can easily retreat away from it. And just having the rules and having people sign on the dotted line, I think it goes all the way back to. Uh, uh, Second president of the U.S., uh, John Adams, signed the Alien and Sedition Laws right at, I mean, within 12 years after he signed all of the aspects of the Constitution and everything else. And all the rules and design of the institution did not prevent an Alien and Sedition Law from being passed. And it's the check of society to go against those kinds of actions where you see a retreat and an increase in sovereign authority and a decrease in, in the kinds of voice of and the ability of oppositions to occur, particularly press freedoms and things like that. So, lessons learned. Well, power sharing can secure peace, and I think we cannot lose track of that. The problem is how do we move from what Colton calls a negative piece to a civil piece. He didn't use that term, but that's what I call it. Um, power sharing can moderate extremist groups. So there are aspects that I think are genuinely positive about it. But I think that there are key aspects of democracy that are lacking in power sharing arrangements. And furthermore, um, at least my feeling, is stable democracy depends on a dynamic and vibrant society to check sovereign authority balance competing interests and produce new elites. And finally, consolidating democracy in a post-conflict environment occurs through the dispersion of political authority, not through the aggregation of political authority. We do know about an authoritarian peace, but in an article that I wrote with uh, Pobar Hegre, Nilsper Gledic, and uh, Tony Ellingson, I think these are words of uh, Nilsper, the sentence is, well, you might have peace, but it's the peace of a zoo an authoritarian system. And uh, I would say through, not through cages is not the path that we want to achieve peace, but uh, through an exercise of voice and um, a variety of voices and a dynamic environment where new voices can emerge. Thanks. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. We have two commentators.
on this gender balanced panel, as it was argued before. <laughs> so, yeah, first thing, Greek. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting conference and uh, to this panel, which uh, I hope uh, to be able to uh, contribute to based on my um, research on peace building in general and more specifically a PhD I'm writing in political science about. Uh, violence in post-war countries, uh, what happens to the violence after the war ends. I'm looking at the ca cases of Congo and Angola after the wars ended tentatively in both countries in 2002, trying to find out why, seemingly at least, there has been more violence in the Congo than in Angola. Uh, so I haven't you know, focused directly on power sharing, democratization, so much of my work, but I uh, in addition to those countries, I also have worked on several other African cases. So I guess my comments will be informed of my, my knowledge of Sub-Saharan Africa more generally, and of those dilemmas that emerge as one tries to transition from uh, what you can call a violent way of contestation during the war and a less uh, violent way of uh, managing conflict after the war, and I think that's kind of an important point of departure for me, that democratization is actually about conflict. It, it's not, strictly speaking, post-conflict, because uh, democracy is about uh, managing and resolving conflicts in, in less violent ways than what you can do during a war. Uh, but if we, if we, of course, I mean, the interpretation here is post-armed conflict, and uh, power sharing then has been much favored, as Scott uh, very eloquently uh, told us about uh, in his presentation, given the recurrence, wide recurrence after the end of the Cold War to negotiated settlements as uh, ways of ending civil wars, um, and also more recently uh, as a resolution mechanism of electoral violence. Now, I, I sort of um, see power sharing as a bridge possible bridge between war and democracy. And just kind of to rephrase some of Scott's points, uh, you can, uh, I mean, the literature suggests that it's quite easy to get onto that bridge, but it's much more difficult to get off it and to get into democracy. So, uh, of course, it, it's, it can create a negative piece, but the question is how to kind of transition from peace of power sharing to, to democracy. Um, the challenge during the power sharing agreements is to build trust between the groups who were in, at odds during the war. Uh, and that, I guess, is often the opportunity missed and for partly structural reasons. Uh, and I think another challenge which um, was not so much highlighted in, in the brief is, is to create new economic opportunities because I think kind of the, the Achilles heel of power incentives it can create for groups who are not part of the initial deal to, uh, to make noise, so much noise, that they too end up around the negotiation table and get some concessions. So kind of you risk uh, creating a slippery slope from power sharing to new violence, to new power sharing, to new violence, and so you continue. Uh, to me, Eastern Congo is a quite clear example of such a dynamic. Uh, so, but you know, if, if there are other opportunities, if, if um, individual civilians do not have so much to lose on picking up a gun, uh, uh, there is so much, not necessarily so much force to that uh, dynamic. Um, more specifically to, uh, to your myth, you know, I kind of took it a bit literally what said, was said in the initial program. I see you have slightly revised it now. But, uh, that post-conflict democratization uh, is successful, that is a myth. In other words, that such uh, democratization is difficult. I mean, I guess that we can all agree on. Uh, but uh, your more specific suggestion about civil society as, as, a, as a way to facilitate transition from power sharing to true democracy, I, I definitely fully agree, and I think it's an important point to kind of shift the focus from the state to, to other non-state forces. Uh, but from many African cases, I guess what you will see is that um, it's all very well to try to support civil society, but you also risk 
uh, that that civil society will, will end up being seen as a puppet, as sort of just an uh, externally supported group that doesn't have a routine. So, so the, I guess the, the deeper challenge uh, implied by a recommendation is that you need to create independent sources of income beyond the state in those post-war societies that can create a truly sustainable civil society that can counterbalance the power of the state. And uh, in, as, as you know, uh, most countries in sub-Saharan Africa depend on, on exports of raw materials for their, um, most of their export uh, revenue uh, and state income. And there is a very strong, you know, merger between political and economic power. So, you know, from my uh, interviews with people in Angola, Congo, also other places, they, they feel very powerless, people in civil society there, to kind of counterbalance because they are so dependent on keeping on good terms with the state. And, and any critique will easily be seen as very dangerous for themselves. And, and of course, they also continuously are under pressure to be co-opted. Uh, so, uh, what I'm getting at, I guess, I, is, is a recommendation of kind of a deeper <laughs> uh, strength of civil society based on a stronger diversification of the economy. And, and also, what I uh, touched on earlier, this issue of building trust during the power-sharing phase, I think much more can be done in many post-war countries to, to uh, su sustain and support uh, dialogues, reconciliation efforts at all levels. I mean, not only between those who sit around the table in the capital, but also at, uh, at various levels in society. Because that will greatly, I believe, facilitate the transition to, to elections, given what we know about how elections can revive tensions and, and violence. I think I'll end there, and I can give back to some more examples uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. I stepped in the last minute, so uh, instead of Peter Eide that can come. So let's see if I get the structure on this. Um, first, you focus on how power sharing mechanisms or the framework for peace uh, hinders or, or promotes democratization. And from the work in different countries that we have in the region, people said, I think, that you could say that, that the framework or the institution in itself seldom uh, yeah, are important, but seldom uh, secures democratization in itself. And, and of course, civil society actors uh, that you focus on are important uh, to us in that respect. But it's also a question, who are the ones sharing power? Uh, you focus on the, the warring parties, those who have been at war, uh, that share power after the war. But in some cases, the real power is not there. Uh, so you also have to look at other aspects of power relations in society, like the economic structure. From the case I know best uh, of all in Guatemala and the elites, the economic elites that actually both finance the war, but also uh, from the government side, but also um, uh, are not a part of the, of, of, of the final accords in that sense. And they continue keeping up power. So you have to also look at, at the distribution of power and resources in society. Who, has, who can afford to participate in politics, even if you have a multi-party system afterwards? Uh, I, think, I think that is an, an important point. Um, so uh, when we, we are working in a lot of post-conflict uh, countries, uh, and, uh, and I would kind of refer to a bit of how we, we relate to that and how we think about what to do. Because I think you have to focus on the actors that are there. <laughs> and you have to work with the actors that are actually there, and not the ones you want to assist. And, and that is the case. So in many of the countries, like in Guatemala, like in Angola, like in Zimbabwe, our focus would be to strengthen civil society. Because we think they are, they are the democratizing force in, 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 in society. And that can actually challenge uh, some of the power structures that are present, and that can promote 
uh, also uh, a more equal distribution of power and resources. Uh, I will come back to a bit about the challenges there, because civil society and civil society is a lot of things. Um, but in other situations, uh, like in, in South Sudan, where we have a fairly large program, uh, there's not much of a civil society uh, uh, in, in the traditional sense that we would think of. Uh, we do work with civil society, we do work with promoting independent media, but we also work with the SPLM. Because if you are going to, that is in government, in, in, in the semi-autonomous uh, uh, government in, in South Sudan, uh, because they are the crucial action for the active for democratization in South Sudan. And you, you can, it's difficult to think that you can get the process of democratization without something happening within the, the, the SPLM. So, so it's about, I, I think, in different situations and, and, and different countries, you have to start to look and analyze who are the actors that can actually promote democracy and in addition to the, the, the more institutional uh, arrangement. So, uh, in that, there are a lot of challenges. Um, one is, of course, that, that uh, like in South Sudan, how do you deal with that, that what creates power and position is merits from the war? And how do you switch to a system where you can actually have civil and political merits uh, to be important to get, to get power? Uh, and then you have to deal also with uh, internal democracy in the organizations and in both in the political parties and in civil society organizations uh, and, uh, um, uh, and look at how, how they can actually be strengthened. And that is, of course, one of the most difficult things you can do as an outside actor. Uh, but but and, and it depends a lot on the trust you have and, and you can build and how close you are in, in, in the processes. Uh, because it's not about arranging courses about democracy, obviously. Uh, when it comes to civil society, it is many times difficult to make a complete division between civil society and uh, those who were active in the war. Uh, that is not necessarily the case uh, because uh, often there are close ties between uh, social movements and uh, guerrilla movements, for example, or uh, opposition movements. Uh, and at least that has been the experience uh, from Latin America in many countries. Um, and, and they're brought up in somehow the same culture and you also get a lot of of challenges and how to deal with that relationship after they have converted into a political party or uh, after the war. Uh, and, uh, and what we see is that there's a huge challenge in how to support organizations to, that, that maybe politically agree with the, 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 the opposition movements that were on earlier in the arms, but how they can be supporting and critical at the same time, how they can be uh, be, be not co-opted and manipulated. Uh, it's, that it is at least the challenge that I, I would like to put on, on the table. And, and maybe the, the another issue is, is uh, which I mentioned a bit earlier, who has resources to participate in politics. And that again has to do with the distribution of economic resources in society. And I, I think that uh, in order to look at democratization in the long run and, and, and uh, to, to get more peeps from society, we have to pick up that issue much more seriously than we have done in the past. I think I will stop there. Thank you so much. These were very interesting comments, and I think uh, Scott will probably try to respond to something. But perhaps first, I'm going to ask a few questions from the audience. That is okay with you, Scott? That's good. Please. Yes. Thank you so much for extremely interesting uh, presentation and, and comments. I have um, uh, an open question to anyone on the panel um, to take on, and it has to do with the uh, problem of the identities of parties 
signing up to a peace agreement. And then, then thinking specifically about the parties um, on the non-state side um, and the problem of um, transformation on the part of a rebel group. Um, in the case of GAM in Aceh, um, the GAM rebels are facing a problem uh, in their process of democratizing and becoming a political party because uh, if they would uh, uh, change their organizational identity, it would mean that the memorandum of understanding uh, or, or that, that the counterpart to the government would sort of disappear. So in that sense, they feel compelled to sort of maintain their um, organizational identity. Um, uh, and uh, I wonder how this, we could deal with this uh, problem uh, in order uh, to make peace agreements actually not stop the demo process of democratization um, after agreement signature. Second question. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, Scott, I missed the last part of your presentation. But uh, reading your paper, uh, I have one question. And that's if, if you check something about how long the power sharing lasts. Because sometimes it's seen as a thing that you do as a sort of a transition for a couple of years. But many of these uh, power sharing arrangements, like Lebanon, seem to go on forever. And maybe that has an impact. And it relates also to your alternative with the state of democracy. Uh, in the paper, you have Liberia as a key uh, case. But uh, I'm, I would say we don't really know until we at least have had one more election. The first election was really very well supervised, and so on. The second election will be their own. And we have seen earlier in other situations that the second election is perhaps the most significant because uh, that's where the parties uh, are less under international scrutiny and so on. So, so these are sort of tests for how long things will last. Yeah, but follow up? No, yeah. just a very quick comment. And that's, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the local elections in Liberia uh, that should have been held this winter were cancelled. And Johnson Sharif uh, appointed all mayors herself. Yeah. So, uh, well, we'll see. I'm not an optimist. Warren? Uh, yeah, we're Warren from EPH there. I want to ask uh, Scott if, uh, to say more about the, the final point uh, you, you were developing, where you were arguing that consolidating democracy requires a kind of dispersion of political authority rather than its concentration. And I was wondering if it, th there, there might be some difficulties in that idea in the sense that it's frequently precisely weak states with ineffective institutional apparatuses that are forced to engage in nationalist or ethnic exclusion, a kind of divide and rule strategy that arises out of the very weakness uh, that they face. And so I wonder if um, you might need a certain amount of, of state strength and, and state capacity and sort of have concentration of power in that sense to be strong enough to, uh, to allow that kind of uh, diversity to, to, to flower in your society, to be strong enough to not be threatened uh, by, by that diversity, not need to exclude it in order to maintain your power. I would suggest that uh, we stop at a happy three or five, depending on how count one counts. I'll go backwards. I like the large area method of backwards. Um, so we'll start with Warren's comment. Um, thanks for that comment. I appreciate it because I think there's probably some happy medium here um, by which I, I, I'm, I guess maybe by nature a little bit uncomfortable with the state strength, uh, failed state uh, literature and I'm reacting to that and so a lot of my statements are reaction to that that kind of literature, uh, but I do think, I take the point as well taken as there has to be a set of institutions. And in particular, um, I think what's really important are these um, kind of adjacent um, institutions, judicial branch, um, a vibrant uh, uh, press, um, uh, election commissions, um, all these kinds of things are very important as an aspect, I mean, we've, as an international community, so much focused on, focused on elections themselves and just holding the election that we've neglected all the other aspects of what constitutes a functioning uh, democracy. 
And all of those things to be functioning require some degree of, of state strength. So a lot of it comes down to what we mean by state strength. And does state strength come from monolithic uh, authority patterns, or does it come from a pattern by which different uh, powers are vested with aspects of authority, that there is an independent judiciary, that there is an independent press. And these things, I think, uh, those are critical dimensions of what I would call a well-functioning democracy. As soon as you start to um, erode those notions of independence, then the problems arise, either through direct state intervention or for, through over partisan uh, orientations, as, as unless there can be a competition and there's an openness to it. I mean, of course, with papers, newspapers, having competing papers about different ideologies is good. Um, one could argue a little bit more about the judicial branch of partisanization, if that's a word. But making your judiciary branch more partisan, I think, is a more problematic issue. Um, and then moving back to Peter's comment, um, I think the, you know, I quoted Jaworski already, and I, I think the second election is not a bad thing. And, and um, as Hovart's intervention uh, points out, I mean, Liberia is not turning, I mean, it turns out to be, if one could paint, or four years ago, paint a wonderful picture about how these women's groups rose up and there was no support, no formal support for them. And you could paint this incredibly romantic picture uh, and then have the first woman leader. And, but things aren't all rosy in Liberia. And um, there are aspects of things where, which I would say are contrary to what I would argue um, towards the development of a well-functioning democracy, unfortunately. Um, with regard to sunset uh, legislation, that basically is a temporary kind of power sharing arrangement. Yes, and I, I have talked about that before, and we did neglected to talk about it here. Um, I think that's an important point to make, and I think it gets into what Inger is talking about in terms of um, the transitions and how you can use the power sharing arrangements. South Africa is an example where um, it was there were power sharing arrangements temporary arrangement, a clear sunset. Okay, on this date, we're not going to have power sharing anymore. I, I, I am very, very much oriented positively towards such arrangements. The, the real problem is towards the permanently vesting them into these kinds of authorities. But it's a very tricky pattern to move, uh, to make that, that transition. Um, but I would argue that South Africa also has a very rich civil society that provided that means of making the transition. Despite the nature of apartheid and, and everything else, um, there are aspects of that society in which, even though there's a single party dominance, there are, uh, it, when we talk about the other aspects of South African society, particularly the judicial branch, a very strong and well-functioning independent judiciary, I think it plays a critical role there. Um, and we see that regularly with corruption trials occurring <laughs> all too frequently. Um, but at least there's trials and arrests and, and whatnot. Um, and then Yana, um, identifying the parties. I, I think this is really a fascinating topic. And I mean, what you often do is environments, well, I use the example of Northern Ireland, and then we had the political branch of Sinn Féin, and then you have the provisional IRA uh, as the military wing. And there were regular denials that they had anything to do with each other. Obviously, they did. Um, and different environments are going to create different ways of doing that. But as what's interesting is that the negotiations occurred with Evans, the Sinn Féin leader, but then who ends up in government was actually the military leader. Was McGuinness, who ends up being in in government. So I think there there are ways that those types of transitions can occur, uh, moving towards. Um, I guess you just kind of move through. I don't know. I mean, I don't have a clear answer. I mean, I think it's a difficult situation, and particularly with the GAM 
what's going to happen there and the nature of particulars makes it even more problematic. Um, we're, Cora and I actually are, we have a conference coming up that we're planning for the fall where we're going to look at political parties and armed conflict. Um, so some of these issues we're exploring, but we're only in a very exploratory stage right now ourselves on the question. Um, now to go to uh, really thank both of you for really rich and contextualizing a lot of the things and then also raising up some problematic aspects, which is what I wanted to have happen on the panel. Um, I, I think there's two themes that emerge out of both of your discussions, and trust building is critical. Um, and I think that really is a fundamental problem. Uh, and, and it's different than even, uh, it moves, there's some sort of transitional process that occurs, and I, I'm not sure that one gets trust busting just by having an inclusive consociational power arrangement uh, by itself. And I do think that we, that one has to move beyond institutional design and only focusing on institutional design. Just saying, oh, we've got this political structure, we got that political structure, end of story, we can walk away. I, I think there's more going on than that, and I think that comes out much more in your comments than it does in, in our presentation, but I, I completely agree with that. I think it's really an important uh, point to bring home. Probably should be a lesson learned here. <laughs> um, and another aspect, I think this came up particularly with Beata's comments about what they've been doing at uh, Norwegian People's Aid, and that there's, there, there is a certain pragmatism that has to occur on the ground, and a case-by-case -case agility to identify who the key actors are, and sometimes <laughs> you just have to hold your nose and say this is who we have to work with. Um, I nonetheless, and I'm not disagreeing with you, I agree completely, but there's part of me that would say that I would like the international community to play a more active role in creating environments that don't reify the power of existing, the existing power structures, which I do view a lot of the static uh, power sharing arrangements do but one to move towards and recognizing environments that can create more dynamic environments by which new power structures can emerge. And I very much do appreciate, I think it was Inge who said, the problems of outside support, maybe you did, or it was you, um, that the problems of uh, you, the international community is giving support to this group, does that create problems itself? And I think that's where the pragmatic aspects of, of a case-by-case appreciation for the problems occurs. Um, what we lay out, I think, is a general problem, and I think that our general critique is against a, let's just fix the institutions and all everything else will be all fine. And if we hold an election, magic will occur. And um, unfortunately, I, I kind of thought that those lessons had been learned, <laughs> but I, I'm not convinced that that's been the case. Um, that, that that lesson is truly learned. Um, and I think that a lot of power sharing arrangements, also kind of the, uh, the recipe of the day, is still a pretty strong recommendation without appreciating the nuanced aspects that are very, and some of the particularly uh, problematic aspects of these kind of inclusive arrangements and the perverse incentives that are set up, I think you really um, articulated really well. Yeah, I just had a comment to follow up on your very good question, like how do you transition as an armed group to a political party and how can that be done without uh, slowing down or even reversing the democratization process? And I was like trying to think about one party that had done so, and I, the, the example that came to my head was, was South Africa actually, with National Party. They were part of a power sharing arrangement and they transitioned, I mean of course you can say they weren't an armed group during apartheid, but they did, after all, run that very brutal state, and they were a part in the conflict. Uh, and I sort of find that an interesting case also of uh, uh, an arrangement where there the were quite strong guarantees 
you know, the National Party, those who stood behind the party, they could be pretty safe that in the new South Africa they would be okay. Uh, whereas, for instance, in the other cases I know, Angola and the Congo, you see two different dynamics. UNITA in Angola, they transitioned into political party, but it hasn't been become a democracy at all. It has gone in the opposite direction. And in, in the Congo, you had one party that, I mean, all parties were, no, I'm sorry, some groups were supposed to transition into political parties. And one which did so, they lost, uh, they, they used to dominate in the East, the RCD, and they lost the elections in 2006. And after that, I mean, uh, some people associated with the party uh, started a new armed group, or they had already done so, and they turned to violence after the elections and uh, continued to wreak havoc in the Congo until 2009. So that's kind of a, a another story. So I think uh, those examples show us different scenarios. It's one argument that a lot of the pro power sharing people talk about, and it's the attraction of, of well, it's the problem from a Jaworski perspective of the uncertainties of elections that you guarantee a stake, but you will avoid the sore loser problem. Because everybody's guaranteed to be, instead of competing over the pie, you just divide the pie out. And everybody's guaranteed a piece. Yeah. But once the election comes, it's winner takes it all. Yeah. You know, yeah. and those who lose, they lose everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, no, I, I completely agree that you have to look in at the con continue just the, the election fix or the institution fix. It, it, that, that is not what will lead to to democratization, and then it is extremely important to to work with uh, with other groups and and uh, with civil society organizations. And we also see that you have to, to, to look at civil society organizations, not in terms only on NGOs, but also try to see how do you get representative organizations within civil society. And, and that has not uh, been the trend uh, for, from uh, international cooperation in all societies. It's much easier to work with someone who much more like us than, than, than with many of the, of the more grassroots movements uh, in the different countries. Um, the other thing about uh, transition from a political point, no, from, a, from a, an armed movement to, to a political party, there are, it, it, it would be interesting to, and someone has certainly done that, uh, to look at the difference between the FMLN and the URNG. Uh, look at Salvador. It's, uh, uh, the FMLN transited in, into a political party relatively successfully and has been a strong opposition. Uh, that was not a power sharing arrangement. Uh, and, but there has been a strong opposition for many years and, and won the elections like 20 years later. No, yeah, yeah, actually it's 20. Because yeah, it's 20 years. Uh, while the UNG did not have the, well, well, has converted into a political party, but with much more difficulties. They also were much weaker during the war, uh, at least at the end of the war. And, uh, and, and does not manage actually to capture the vote on the left side in Guatemala. Uh, so so, so they, they prob there's probably more support than, than the UNG manages to, to, to capture. So, but in any case, they lay down the arms. Uh, that can be the positive part of it. So, so, but there is a, there is a strong and difficulty uh, and, and, and that's what I refer to partly with what, what is what, what you can, um, what are the merits that count? Are they the war merits or is it the, the, the sort of more civil political capacities in a post-war situation? I remember when uh, after the peace accords in, in, in Guatemala, the, the, the commandantes, the, the chiefs of the guerrilla movement said they would never be candidates. Uh, and they've been candidates, almost all of them, except the ones who died. Uh, so, so it's it's uh, <laughs> so still the, the the merits from the war matters, and and and, and uh, even if even if quite some time has passed. So, so I think that is a crucial point in in that kind of conversion process. Welcome to the final session of today's seminar. I promise that we have saved the best bits for last, uh, and that's true. Uh, we have two uh, contributions or, or two items on this final session. The first one uh, will be presented by the Steve Jobs of Grimnet, as well as I say. Um, 
labels you. Um, Luke Shiradai, uh, researcher at ETH Select. Uh, he will give a, a nice, I hope, and I'm sure, presentation of a forthcoming uh, web-based data platform and a visualization tool. Uh, so please look, go ahead. Okay, uh, if you don't mind, I will stay uh, seated so that I can use a microphone and operate the computer at the same time. Not enough? Yeah. Um, so today I would like to uh, tell you about our efforts to uh, build uh, a fed federated data platform at uh, ETH3. Uh, this platform is called uh, Rover. And of course, I should tell you just a few words about our motivation. Uh, one of the main goals is that we have several data sets, not just our own, but from also partner institutions. And there is a big need to you know, glue together, put together all this data into one uniform data model. Um, we also have the need to uh, have uh, efficient uh, storage of data, and in, in particular, including uh, spatial data, GIS uh, information. Uh, <clears throat> we also do a lot of um, coding efforts, and uh, which include experts throughout the world. And for this, there's a big need to have uh, uh, tools that support the collaborative uh, editing of uh, data set. Um, and all these data sets, of course, they are reg regularly uh, updated, so um, one needs to have some facility to handle that. And uh, last, but probably also very important, one needs to have good methods in order to retrieve data out of the, the database and to be able to either visualize them or analyze them using statistical learning techniques. Um, so we did uh, come up with a divide and conquer approach to, uh, to, uh, to deal all with all these needs. And we basically, we have a, a database called the DBE, the database backend, uh, in the, the middle that, that holds basically all the data uh, and that can also store GIS uh, information. And this database, can be edited using the, the CFE, the coding front end, uh, that uh, this tool is not yet uh, finished, uh, that will uh, allow uh, people to collaboratively edit the data in the database. And of course, it also supports to have external sources of data that could be Google spreadsheet, database elsewhere, and so on, that can be directly fed into like data warehouse. And then we have two kind of like output stream. Uh, one is uh, the research front end, so FE. Uh, this is meant really for, for, for researcher. So uh, right now we have a base uh, front end so that people can access the data from R and also uh, Java using the Java programming language. Um, but also to, to make the, the, the data more understandable, understandable by the large public. For this, we have uh, the public front end, the other way it's written for data publication, the PFE. Uh, that is meant for really uh, giving e easy access to the data in a visual way. And that's where I will uh, focus the remaining of uh, the presentation. So for this public front end, uh, we, uh, we built uh, an interactive visualization tool uh, with multiple views of the same or different part of, of the data, and of course everything is uh, uh, interactive. Uh, it, use, it doesn't rely on the on our dat database backend directly, because otherwise one would absolutely need an online connection to, to the database server uh, in order to demonstrate the software or to use it. So instead, we may, it contains a copy, an offline copy of all the data uh, locally. And it's a Java-based application, so it's 
it is an application you have to download, install on your computer, and then invest it in the bank locally. But then you don't need any network connections. And, that. and basically, all the data is currently, uh, uh, currently combined quite a lot of uh, data that can be at the country level, like ethnic groups, administrative units, conflicts, uh, grid based uh, data, and that's what I'm going to show uh, now. So let me. That was a few hours ago, that was the interface that I was uh, supposed to, uh, to show you, but of course, I guess you don't see anything. Um, no, it's a little bit. The problem is that on the screen it looks very sleek. Huh? Um, but we <laughs> used a, a dark interface and on a projector this doesn't look so, so right. So just uh, spend my uh, quality lunch uh, changing the, turning the interface into a, with a white background. And there may be some, let's say, rough corners uh, uh, because the uh, lunch break was a bit uh, too short, um, as you can notice. <laughs> uh, so there are basically three main views in the tool in the upper right. There is a world map. Uh, then we are in the middle, there is a detailed map uh, that will soon appear. And then uh, time series information at the bottom. And so the tool works like this. You have to um, first select a, a country of interest. So in order to select a country, it's not so uh, easy, let's say, for Europe with small countries like uh, like mine, like or Switzerland. But of, uh, fortunately, you can zoom in. You can zoom in ever using a, a trackpad that's with two fingers um, or with a mouse wheel or using the, the sliders on top of, of the map. Then you can select a, a country. I think I pick one that I know pretty well. Um, and on the right side of the interface, uh, you can choose some layers that you can display into this detailed map in the middle. Uh, so right now, there is a country border that is displayed uh, in addition to the uh, ethnic groups uh, in that country. Um, one can uh, change or let's say one has a choice between different layers that will probably be extended in, in the future, but that's what is uh, currently available. So data about ethnic groups, about also administrative units, uh, maybe we can uh, switch, and about uh, different grid-based uh, layers uh, where the, the world has been decomposed into I think nine millions uh, cell uh, with, uh, for example, elevation uh, data. Uh, where you can uh, see where there's mountains. Uh, you can overlay this with any of the other layers, uh, remove them if you want to, uh, to see things more, more clearly. And okay. And then uh, <coughs> here we have the ethnic groups uh, displayed. So there are three of them: uh, Swiss, French, Swiss, Italian. Uh, and so the so detailed map is also interactive. So you can click on one of them, and then you also see. In the time series view at the, the bottom, uh, how things, uh, how these ethnic groups uh, evolved over time. Of course, this is Switzerland, so uh, not much is uh, happening there. Uh, you, uh, at least you can see that basically, if you switch the administrative units layer, then if I scroll down, I see that there is one uh, canton, so that, uh, that's where I come from. Huh? <laughs> uh, that started to appear in uh, 79. And one can also, on all this map, uh, uh, 
change the, the, the time by ever moving this slider on top or by directly clicking here in the time stage if you want from any of the time points. So one can see that you can go from 1978 to 1979 and see in the upper uh, left corner of that face a new administrative unit that, that appeared. Uh, of course, you can you can also click on any of these uh, units and get uh, detailed information in the in the right panel. Right now, there is very little information in there, but this can be uh, enhanced with a uh, lot more uh, information. Uh, so I can maybe focus uh, on the different part of the world in the more probably more interesting, uh, uh, like India. Uh, yeah. So now you have uh, India with uh, ethnic groups that are displayed. And what you can uh, uh, also see is that the political status of each of these uh, uh, ethnic group may have changed over time. When one probe over some of, the, of them, it gets displayed, you know, that this was a poor less uh, uh, ethnic group or a junior partner, uh, a senior partner, always about the political stages so, of the ethnic group. One can also see that uh, when they are underlined or when they line, on top and below them, that means that we have been in a conflict during that period. Um, so you can see that uh, And one can also probably see that if we switch to another country, let's say Ethiopia, yeah, if I switch the administrative units uh, layer, one can see that some of them, they, they appear and disappear, and also when there are crosses, that there was a conflict uh, at that time. Uh, uh, and maybe finally I should show a bit more of this uh, grid-based uh, layers. Uh, Basically, let me take maybe an interesting country. Uh, one can choose between not just having uh, elevation, but also nightlight data. Let's see. Yeah, uh, we take for, for France. Uh, I forgot to mention that one, all this. Uh, the, the detailed view is also zoomable, right? You can zoom in uh, as much as you want uh, to really get to this each of this individual cell. Uh, so that you can choose between the nightlight data, uh, that is usually a good proxy for, for GDP or population data. Uh, so GDP estimate uh, and so on. And I think this is um, maybe one more thing <coughs> I want to, to mention is that there is a, uh, when there are overlaps, uh, especially with ethnic groups, they are drawn with uh, transparency. So you can maybe see here that the these two ethnic groups, they overlap on, on a little region here in the middle, and that's why it gets assigned a different um, color. There's a kind of like transparency effect. And uh, I should also mention that all the, the sources for, for data, uh, we think that to provide solid references on how to cite them and so on, this will be incorporated into right now to just give an example you get you can get information about each layer that you use and uh, and uh, get information about how to 
site them exactly, and um, later on there will be also linked to websites and, and things like this. And one can, uh, there are different options to turn <coughs> on the, and on and off uh, the filling of the polygons for the administrative units or for the ethnic group, or to switch on and off uh, the, the labels. So I should maybe just a uh, few, <coughs> uh, a few information about where we stand right now. We have you know, this database backend is starting to be uh, to be solid, uh, uh, so we are done with that. At least for this research front end to extract data and feed directly the data into. Um, <coughs> Uh, statistical uh, tools like R, this is also working uh, pretty well. And one can, uh, you can also imagine that using this collection of data, you can make some uh, really smart, uh, ask some very smart question to the, to, to the database, like uh, for a given ethnic, ethnic group, find out what is the average uh, GDP for the part that uh, overlap with a certain administrative units or things like this. Uh, you can make some very sophisticated queries, not just at the numerical level, but also at the spatial level. Um, and there is this uh, public front end that I just showed to you. And so the focus uh, from now on will probably be uh, to, uh, to finish this uh, public front end and hopefully to, uh, to have it released uh, ne sometime next year is before the, the next conference, or during the next conference, uh, to, uh, to fully uh, develop this coding front end where we only have a, uh, a prototype right now and that become uh, very much needed for us in order to collaboratively edit data and to, uh, to, uh, to continue the development of this research front end more by simplifying it, by adding some uh, web interface to it so that people can easily retrieve uh, data and to load them into Excel or any other statistical software. And if you have questions, if you think your data should also be part of this tool or if you want to um, te beta test uh, the software, then feel free to get in touch with me. Thanks for this very intriguing uh, presentation and we certainly all look very much forward to the Zurich conference sometime in 2011 hopefully uh, well, uh, when the first version of the uh, Grow Up uh, public front end uh, will be released. So uh, thanks again, Luke. Let me say a few words while um, we're getting going here about the Human Spirit Report project is funded by um, the governments of Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, and Canada, and occasionally by um, foundations. And we rely very, very heavily on the work um, done at Uppsala and, uh, and, uh, and at Prio. And we see as part of our, uh, our mission is that we, we undertake some of our own analysis, but we rely, rely on other people's data. And we see very much our mission as taking the best research that's actually out there and translating it in a way that is successful to policy makers. So, I have this thing here, I'm not actually quite sure what to do with it. What do I press it? Okay. So I guess what I wanted to talk a, a little bit about is why it's the case that some false, what turns, what are just, there are many, many false claims, but very, very few of those false claims become urban myths. Um, and many of them, I think, if you look at the word as it's traditionally used, appeal to our sense of the bizarre. Two examples, one's up there, Mountain Dew, which is a rather unpleasant lemon and lime soda drink, it sold in the United States, and its so sales went down quite dramatically amongst young males <laughs> when the rumor came out that it caused their testicles to shrink and their sperm count to drop. And then some of you have probably heard of the kidney heist story. 
It's bizarre, it's gruesome, widely believed, and it's a complete urban myth. There's no evidence for it. And the story goes something like this. A young woman goes into a bar, she's given a drink by somebody, the drink is doctored, she goes back, she passes out, she wakes up sitting in a, in a bath filled with ice with a phone beside the bath that says, call 911 now, you have no kidney. And this was, so the argument was that this was, and people believed this so much that the Kidney Foundation actually sent out a message to say, please let us know if you woke up in a, a bath of ice sometime. <laughs> it was another complete urban myth. But what, I mean, the really interesting thing is, why does this appeal to people? And when it does appeal to them, what is it that makes them want to have mass emailing so that they let everybody else? Now, of course, the, urban, the myths that we're talking about aren't really like those. These are some, I think, of the urban myths of conflict research, rich menu of choices, 300,000 child soldiers, you've all heard it. Um, it was a figure that came out from Gracha Machel's um, report back in the mid-1990s. It stayed at 300,000, even though most of the big wars that were employing child soldiers came to an end. It was reduced down to a quarter of a million um, in about 2003-2004. And it had, the, the, its provenance is completely unknown. Um, Gracia Marcello apparently was a group of people sitting around a table and they said, it's, that sounds about right. Rachel Brett's. Rachel, Rachel Brett? Table. Yeah, that was, she, that was Rachel Brett was sitting around the table. She was, uh, yeah. she went, yeah. Um, then there's the women, the greatest victims of warfare. Um, if you look at any of the data, clearly and obviously it's mostly men that get killed in battle. But it is interestingly the case that women also suffer, dis uh, men suffer disproportionately from indirect deaths, um, from persecution, and um, surprisingly, I mean surprisingly very much for us, um, that there is also a considerable level of, even in sexual violence, there is um, a considerable percentage of men, around 10% in, in many cases, of men who are victims of sexual violence, where overwhelmingly it's women, the interesting thing, a study that we're, we've got from Sierra Leone by Dara Cohen suggests that something like 25% of the perpetrators of sexual violence were in fact women. So, and then the 90% of victims of war are civilians. Um, Uppsala claims that that may have come from them. When I was at the UN, um, I phoned up um, somebody who claimed to have, um, well, came to have had this report and I asked her, um, where did she get the data from? She said, well, it was a young woman who was working for us. She was very intelligent, but she couldn't remember her name. <laughs> um, the two, the, oh, sorry, the, the two, uh, two of the um, urban myths that we, uh, in a sense, uncovered in our most recent report, that everybody assumes that mortality rates increase in wartime. We found that between 1970 and 2008, in 95% of all country wars, the mortality rates declined in wartime. And if that sounds a little bit bizarre, and people said to us, when comes, you mean that war is good for your health? No, of course we don't mean that. But mortality rates are actually going down in peacetime, and today's wars, because they kill relatively few, few people, aren't enough, aren't, aren't deadly enough to reverse that decline. And then the last one that we came to was, and when people said to us, well, that's ridiculous, those claims, what about the DRC? 5.4 billion people died or wouldn't have died between 1998 and 2007. We said that was a good question, and when we started looking into this claim, we found that it was um, grossly inflected. Um, two major reasons for that, which I can go into if anybody's interested, but the real death toll, still huge, still very alarming, but le almost certainly less than half that, uh, that toll. Challenging myths can be controversial. When we were about to launch the 2005 um, Human Security Report in New York, we got word that a number of the major NGOs, Oxfam, um, International Crisis Group, International Rescue Committee, um, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, were very, very concerned that the message that came out of that report, which was a message that came from um, data that people had produced here, the message that the war, world was getting more warlike was not welcome at all. Um, NGOs were concerned that um, if governments believed things were getting better, then they will feel that they didn't have to do as much, 
and they'll cease to support the advocacy groups. One UN official actually said to us, look, even if it's true, shut up about it or they'll take our money away. Um, and saying things aren't as bad as has been claimed can surprisingly cause a great deal of offense. If you actually found out 5.4 million people haven't died in the DRC, it was only, say, half that, you might think, well, well that's a relief. 2.4 million people that we thought were dead aren't dead after all. But in fact, this can cause grave, grave offense. Um, Alex de Waals pointed out that when he queried some of the numbers um, for death, death toll in, in Darfur, where the claim had been up to 400,000, he was roundly attacked for not caring about the, about the suffering of the people um, in Darfur. There was no logic to that, but that was it. So the, point, the other point we want to make here is that myths are very often reflect the interests of the advocacy groups themselves. Worse means better. As I say, there's the child soldiers figure. If you can make, if you put a figure out there that shocks people, the argument is that in shocking people, 5.4 million deaths in the DRC, or uh, Nick Kristof claiming that 75% of women in Liberia have been raped, this somehow will shock the conscience of the international community and cause them to, um, to provide the resources to do something to try and prevent it or stop it. Um, Ian Smiley and Larry Minier came out with, I think, is that they capture this in a very real sense. It's common practice for those seeking funds to exaggerate need in a highly competitive environment, made competitive by great needs and inadequate funding. Exaggeration not only pays, it's sometimes the only thing that will dislodge funding from donors who, who themselves have too few resources and too many supplicants. And one of, the, one of the challenges here, I think, is that, and this is particularly true with uh, humanitarian NGOs, but also true of development NGOs as well, is they're very often doing the assessment which will establish what the need is, and then the governments give them money on the basis of that need. And when Ian Smiley was uh, talking to a lot of the NGOs about this, they said, well, look, yeah, we sure we exaggerate. But we know that the government is only going to give us about a half of what we ask for, so we pitch the ask up. And then when you talk to governments, they say, look, we just don't trust the NGOs. We'll never give them as much as they ask for because we know they exaggerate. <laughs> it's a really difficult system. And Paul, Paul Spiegel of UNHCR and said that no, the, only really, the only way around this is to separate the assessment function from the humanitarian groups, or at the very, very least, to have the humanitarian groups have an independent epidemiologist to oversee, um, oversee the, uh, the, the surveys themselves. Um, we found back in 2000, but even before 2005, when I was working at the UN, and Ted Gurr came out with a report that was later published in Foreign Affairs. I'd circulated around amongst my colleagues, and it showed quite clearly that war numbers were declining, even then in, in 1998. There was deep skepticism within the UN. The UN didn't have any data on conflict trends. It still doesn't. There is no official, there are no official data on, uh, on security issues. We have Millennium Development Goals and data for that. There's no Millennium Security Goals. And anyway, the UN's experience in the 1990s certainly didn't suggest that things were getting better, rather that they were getting worse. And they were sort of correct. Because the number of conflict onsets in the 1990s is actually double what it was in the 1980s. But the number of terminations was even greater again, and that's what caused the net decline. So when I circulated this, this GER paper, and people just looked at it and said, yeah, don't believe it. It's, it's crap. And then they would tell me about all the terrible things that happened in the 1990s. <coughs> so then the article came out in Foreign Affairs, and I circulated it again. It's Foreign Affairs. It's not just an article. And a few people took notice, but not much. It was too long. It was about 15 pages. And then Ted wrote an op-ed for the LA Times, and I circulated that, and people came up and said, why didn't you tell us about this before? And the point about that is just to say that the policymakers are so busy, they never, ever have time, or very rarely have time. They never read academic articles. They rarely have time to read anything in foreign policy or foreign affairs. Paul Collier tells a nice story at the time that when he was working in the banks, the head of the bank's research department, and uh, he got called into Jim Wolfenson's office, and Jim Wolfenson said, Paul, he said, and he got an article from an op-ed that Paul had just done for the Financial Times. He said, this is fascinating stuff. Why didn't you tell me about this? 
And Paul Collier, of course, had been sending all his reports up to the, to the head office. And again, Wolferson never had any time. If it's in the newspaper, especially if it's in the Financial Times, the respectable newspaper, then they take notice. And that, for us, is a pretty signal, important lesson. We figured if people are going to take notice of the extremely important work that you guys do and we distill and, and put out there and add our own, own spin to it, it's pretty important to get it into the media. And uh, getting it into the media is, uh, is quite difficult, but I think it's well worth, well worth the effort. So, to go back to why is there the resistance, I'm talking now primarily about the UN. The UN is an organization that has no research culture. It's quite different from the bank in that sense. Policymakers don't have time to read. And even if they did read, they wouldn't understand anything that they read in the sort of journals that most people here write in. And you know, I know everybody puts us in the, in the last but one paragraph, it says the message here for policymakers. I mean, if you want to put it in there, it's fine, as long as you don't believe that policymakers are ever going to read it. Um, and policy, and again, speaking about the UN here, tends to be determined by the mandate, by politics, and by precedent. It's very rarely the case that it's evidence-based. It's rarely the case that it relies on research. Research findings are going to be welcomed if they support current practice, if they don't support current practice, they'll be ignored or dismissed. Um, McCartan Humphreys and Jeremy Weinstein, who many of you know, wrote an extraordinary paper on DDR, the DDR process in Sierra Leone, and they did something that nobody had ever done before. They looked at two groups of people, uh, a former combatants, one who'd been through the DDR process and the other who hadn't, equally matched, and they found that in terms of re successful reintegration into the community, there was absolutely no difference between the two. In other words, the, the, the reintegration part of the UN's poly DDR policy was simply not working. I sent it to, the, I sent it to uh, DPKO and to UNDP, and nobody, there was just no interest. There's a sense in which sometimes people don't want to know that stuff that they're doing doesn't work because they're too busy and they haven't got time to fix it. And they wouldn't know how to fix it anyway. So, I think the, the other message I want to come out is that change is coming. As everybody knows, Paul Collier and his colleagues, some of them here, put uh, conflict research, quantitative conflict research on the, on the map in the bank uh, at the beginning of the new millennium. The New World Development Report 2011 is going to be focusing on fragile states and conflict. It's going to be involving a lot of people in the conflict uh, research community. Um, and the bank, as I say, um, has got a research culture. The UN doesn't have a research culture, but even in the UN, things are beginning to change. I mean, some of you, Peter, you had people from, uh, UN, from the Department of Political Affairs at your conference recently. In my time, that didn't happen. There is, of course, far more people today working in the mediation support unit is huge compared to it wasn't one when I was there, and now it's quite large. And they're beginning to read, they're beginning to read the, the, the literature. And this, I think, is probably why the, the, the mantra that you get now in all donor countries um, and all international agency is that policy ought to be evidence and analysis based. Um, DFID has something called public service agreements, which have nothing to do with what we might normally think of a public service agreement. But it's basically the Treasury turning around to other departments in government and saying, look, you keep on saying you're doing a great job. We want hard quantitative evidence that you are doing a great job. And this has led to a certain amount of panic in DFID because how do you actually have evidence that you're making wars go down? Um, so what they've actually done is that they're using, um, they're using material from Uppsala to actually track the decline in wars. And they put up as their target um, that wars should decline by 2% a year. And we said, don't do that. It was, they said, why? They were declining at 3% a war a, a year for the sort of the 19th. And we said, please don't do that. And they did it. And of course, now we see a flattening out that's beginning to go back up again. And there are these panic stricken phone calls saying, can't you, don't you have some more data that shows us something? <laughs> the ridiculous thing about that was that even if it was declining at 2% a year, it takes an extraordinary amount of hubris for Diffie to turn around and say, oh, and that was us that did it. <laughs> so it's, you know, evidence-based research is a good thing, but it can take us in some slightly uh, 
different strange direction. Secretary General's 2010 report on 1325, Women, Peace and Security. Almost the entire report is devoted to the need for new indicators. And they canvassed lots of people and they came up with a list of 1,500 indicators on Women, Peace and Security. That's now been boiled down, I don't know how many, 30 or 40 or something like that. And so, and now for the very first time, they're actually talking about the need for evidence, because up until now, every Secretary General that's gone along and reported on 1325 has no idea at all whether things are getting better or things are getting worse, because there's no data. There's just anecdote and speculation out there. So that's pretty, this is pretty encouraging. Um, Canadian government has got a, um, an action report, a five-year action report dealing with this. And again, they're focusing, on the, they're focusing on the need for indicators. They haven't yet gotten around to figuring out what it is that you actually need in order to get that sort of data. In our um, Shrinking Costs of War report, one of the things that we propose, which seemed to be so obvious to us that we wonder why it had never been done before, is that you should get the Security Council to mandate at the beginning of every new peace operation a DHS-type nationwide survey that would take a snapshot of the country looking at security, looking at health, looking at livelihoods. And then two years later, you do the same again. So for the very, very first time, you would actually have a peace operation that started out with an evidence base, and two years later, you'd be able to have more evidence to suggest, to indicate whether um, your policies were having any impact or not. Um, there's been a considerable amount of interest in that um, in, the, in the UN. Um, but we think it really needs a, um, a group of donors to push the idea very hard. It's incredibly cheap, by the way. It costs about between one and two million dollars for one of these uh, one of these surveys. And when you consider that the UN is spending nine billion a year at the moment on peace operations, it's certainly not money isn't the problem. Okay, how to challenge the myths? We've actually been talking about two different types of myths today. Some of the things that we've been talking about here, you've been talking about today, are really disagreements. They're not so much myths. Um, and some of those, what I've been talking about, some of the myths that have entered the policy discourse, that's the 300,000 sol child soldiers and so forth. Um, Avad Hegre and Nick Sambanas wrote an article in 2006 um, which indicated a huge degree, uh, a huge lack of consensus within the conflict research community um, about the causes of war on sets and duration, and I'll come back to that at the end. Um, but before I finish, it's just a, a, a say a word about the Greenwood Smith. And I thought that um, the Greenwood's paper today was absolutely spot on. And we think it's really, really, really critical because if grievances don't matter, it must be football. <laughs> if, if grievances don't matter, as Jim, Jim Fearon continues to insist that grievances don't matter, Paul Collier has, in his most, in his, not his most recent book, but the Guns, Bombs and Ballots book, um, has a very, very nice phrase in there where he admits, in a sense, that grievances do matter, and says he didn't used to, this didn't used to be his position, but he has now, quote, moved on, unquote. Which is, not that I was wrong, but for 10 years, but I've now... I have moved on. So what we think is important about this is if grievances really don't matter, then conflict resolution doesn't matter, mediation doesn't matter, peacemaking, they're all irrelevant. And if you actually read Jim Furon very carefully, Jim never mentions any of these things, and understandably from his point of view, because if grievances don't matter, then this doesn't matter either. And we think that that is profoundly uh, a profoundly reactionary position. It's also one, I think, that isn't, isn't taken seriously um, by the international community because there is still a huge amount of work going into peacemaking um, and so forth. And if you actually, if you actually ask what's left, um, then if you're Jim Fearon, you're essentially stressing the idea of opportunity and feasibility and state capacity. And I asked Jim about this once. I said, it sounds like a recipe for counterinsurgency. And Jim has said, you know, he preferred the term security sector reform. And we are, we are opposed to the uh, arguments about free opportunity and feasibility. We think they make a great deal of sense, but they're not, they're not incompatible with grievance theories. And in fact, it makes mo much more sense to us to think, uh, think of both. So final point, how do we make our, wor our work at the Human Security Report resonate in the policy world? And we've been reasonably successful at that.
and how do we minimize the impact of NIFs? Well, our approach is essentially, firstly, we, for the reasons that I uh, suggested earlier, is we try to get media coverage. If it's in the media, the policy community is more likely to take it seriously. It's just as simple as that. We focus on what we think would be high impact core messages, and we spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, we like to be contrary to challenge conventional wisdoms, but this can upset people, and if you upset people, that can generate a controversy, and the controversy keeps the ideas alive, and providing you're on the right side of the controversy, and you remain correct, then that's on balance not a bad thing. And then we deliver our findings in layers. And this is really important. We have the one-page press release, which is just there. The average journalist press release comes across his or her desk. They're going to look at it in five seconds. If they're not grabbed in the first paragraph, you've lost them. And then so if you grab them, then they'll be persuaded to read the five to eight page um, executive summary, um, overview, whatever you want to call it. And then there's the full report, and they won't actually read that, but what they'll do is they'll look at it, they'll see there's lots of footnotes, they'll read a fraction here and a fraction there, sounds sensible. Um, we have our technical discussions um, are relegated to footnotes. Um, they're the sort of things that you would put in the text if you were writing for uh, JCR, JPR, or whatever. And we spend a lot of time on these two up here, because they're the only parts that may be read by most people. We're realistic about that. And the footnotes were the things that are real interest to academics. They're probably only about 1% of the people that actually read the report will ever read those. And then we launch at the UN. And by the way, there's nothing to stop any of you launching at the UN. All you have to do is to call up your, your mission and say we have an incredibly important report that's about to change the, to change the future of the world. And um, we'd like you to organize a press conference for us. And they can do that for you. So... My last point is that I think that, and in a sense, it's fortunate that, um, that policymakers don't read um, academic research, <laughs> is that there's a sense in which it would be a really good thing if there was more discussion within the field about things about which people disagree quite fundamentally. These are some of the, some of the, different, some of the differences in the literature. Ethnic difference has no impact on the rest of armed conflict, and it does. Primary commodities matter, and they don't. Increases in the levels of democracy reduce the risk of war, they have no impact. And you, can, you can see what I mean. And again, the risk of war. And so there are, there is, there are contradiction after contradiction after contradiction, and yet there's very little engagement, as far as we can see, on those contradictions. There are sometimes, I mean, the work you're doing on, the, on grievances is engagement, but a lot of the time there isn't a great deal of engagement on this. And as long as people can get stuff published in journals, there's in the sense in which why, why, why get involved in a fight with anybody else? That seems to us to be um, uh, an important thing. So, in my last couple of years, policy and literature. So, anyway, I'll, st I'll, stop on, I'll stop on that point there. We're lucky that we have, uh, we, we're lucky we have policy makers that are too busy. Thank you. very stimulating final remarks and in fact uh, the reason why we have been focusing on the policy here is has a lot to do with the Andy's very spirited and inspiring performance of the last uh, grown at the conference uh, so uh, we count Andy as a member of the uh, grown family as well and uh, now I, I realize that uh, uh, I am in a tough spot because I'm standing between you and the reception and especially in Norway, where there's a scarcity of alcoholic beverages, that is a very dangerous spot to be in. Uh, now, the good news is that uh, the beverages will not include Mountain Dew, I hope. <laughs> uh, and although I would warn you that uh, if there are some beverages coming from certain basements in Norway, you uh, may not have to watch out when it comes to your uh, kidney uh, functionality, but your eyesight may. Uh, so, uh, in any case, um, uh, I would like to uh, take this uh, opportunity to thank uh, a number of people. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, the speakers, 
and the panel participants uh, today, especially our external guests. Uh, but I would also want to thank the audience for absolutely fantastic questions, a very good discussion. Uh, but uh, last but not least, of course, uh, I would like to express our gratitude to all the people who were involved in really putting together this conference, a lot of hard work. Uh, I would like to thank you on Halberg, uh, Kova Strand, uh, Halberg Buhau, and Scott Gates. And I'm sure I've forgotten names here, but uh, we are uh, really very impressed by the infrastructure here. And I would like to thank Prio and the Center uh, as well uh, for hosting this conference. Uh, it's been fantastic. Uh, well, that said, I think we should head for the hopefully safe beverages. Thank you.